Hi everyone, welcome to CCNA Cloud course. This particular course is part 1 where we learn about Cloud Fundamental. You can see the paper code is 210451. Now what we learn in this particular course, let me show you that, that the topics that I am going to cover is what is Cloud, what is the deployment model and the further in this particular course we learn about virtualization what is server virtualization, what is network virtualization, infrastructure virtualization like that. Finally further in part 2 of this particular course you'll learn more about the storage so what is the block storage, file storage and different type of products who is supporting this storage technology. Finally in the chapter number 4 or you can see this uh, part number 5 actually you have these things like you will learn about Cisco UCS you will learn about Cisco ACI and SDN means innovations of Cisco in terms of uh, LAN in terms of WAN as well I will I will give you touch upon SDN WAN as well okay finally we have unified computing the infrastructure portfolio and integrated infrastructure now what type of books you can refer obviously you can refer CCNA cloud cert guide and then you can refer the CCNA Cloud Complete Study Guide from the Cybex publication. Okay, so let me go again back and show you that how this course is further divided. This course is further divided into two parts. Uh, we are doing here Cloud Fundamental. Once you complete that, then you have to pass this exam that is the Cloud Administration. Uh, if you are familiar with Cisco exam, you know that you will get 90 minutes and you have to uh, answer say 55 to 65 questions depending upon multiple choice, single choice, drag drop, all those things. Okay, so here also uh, the exam pattern will be the same and you will get approximately 55 to 65 questions related to these technologies. Okay, these technology and parallel you can see the percentage as well 14, 16, 24, 22 and 24. So I hope this particular course is going to be very informative to you in terms of that how you will learn this Cisco Cloud and I hope you will implement this uh, in your work and profile. In chapter 1 we will study about what is cloud computing, then what are the foundational things inside the cloud, what is cloud hype, the history behind this cloud computing, the common cloud characteristics, the on-demand self-service, rapid elastic elasticity polling services, etc. So one by one I'll hit all these things. Let us start with our topic and let us talk about that what is cloud computing. Now suppose if you have to fly from India to Germany then you will purchase the entire airlines or what you will do? Obviously, you book a ticket inside uh, inside the aircraft and you will go from India to Germany like that. Okay, so that means, what does it mean that suppose uh, if you want a particular compute infrastructure or uh, you can say if you want a particular network infrastructure. Why we need in network infrastructure? So let me break these things say companies. Companies they want what? Profit. And companies they are running over what? Applications. Now these applications need what? These applications need infrastructure, correct? They need IT support. They need infra. They need quick response between client and user. Uh, they they need a spread of network from one branch to other branch one from head office to the branches like that okay so this is that the the overall goal is to increase the income uh, to increase the profit but the other thing is that you have to decrease the infrastructure cost or decrease the other cost involved in uh, in the operations you can say okay so what is the goal about cloud computing is that whenever you need that infrastructure you take that infrastructure whatever time frame you wanted when you are not using that release it 
Okay, so that is the overall goal of this cloud computing that it is something like need based computing or it is something by uh, it is something that once you need it you take that once you don't need it uh, give them back something that whatever you are using you are paying for that correct now let's see the theory what theory says so it, this is not a miraculous product that will provide you all sort of solution but yeah with uh, efficiently using this cloud computing you can reduce the operational cost you can reduce the overall cost of the organization that is the overall goal of this and how you can reduce this because this cloud have some properties it has some inherent properties like it can do on demand self service like it can rapidly stretch the network means you can stretch the infrastructure without needing so much approvals or without needing so much contracts then you can effecti effectively use the resources then you have broad network access because this cloud visibility is at the moment is everywhere in the globe so you, you have that broad network access and finally you can measure the services so you can measure oh I, I, I have taken service A, B, C, D I'm using only B and D so why I will pay for A and C correct so those five things are very important with respect to cloud and if you add all these five things obviously you reduce uh, you will reduce the cost of the operation correct now you can see here the cloud hype that uh, in 2000 8 approx and 9 at that time people are thinking oh cloud is like something will solve everything but once they know the reality now you can see that it is constant at the moment means it's still now people know that okay with cloud I have features means I can reduce the cost but you have to apply this in a proper direction in a proper manner okay again uh, what is the traditional IT challenges that you have low efficiency although you have so many routers firewall workstations in terms of physical things you have uh, you invested lot many in the IT infrastructure but what is the overall outcome and believe me or not that if you see your premises or if you see your infrastructure you will find that the most expensive department is the IT department say for HR what they need they need paper chair table that's it obviously they need one workstation to work but if you see the IT infrastructure you need database uh, infrastructure you need a router you need security devices you need a high expensive servers all these things you need so if you compare the cost of say IT infrastructure with the cost of HR finance sales you'll find IT department cost is very much high so if we compare with the cost with the efficiency is it that much efficient plus it has lack of agility and again that is due to extreme complexity let me show you that what is the definition of this cloud uh, you can refer this uh, evolution of cloud you can say that 1957 uh, IBM has started this this cloud we'll see that in the upcoming lectures that what was the mainframe sharing and then how this cloud has been evolved in 2006 this uh, AWS they really come very hard in the market and at the moment AWS I think they have 90 percent of public or hybrid cloud share at the moment rest all other companies say Cisco I think Cisco has less than 5% of share even Microsoft has less than of 4% of share like that at the moment uh, the leading company in the cloud is the Amazon uh, web services or AWS and they have more than 1000 products at the moment in the market so this is the final definition of the cloud computing uh, let me explain this definition because this definition is very compact it is telling that cloud computing is a model and you can write a demand based model so cloud computing is something called demand based model what it will do to enable the ubiquitous a convenient on-demand network access 
to a shared pool of configura uh, configurable computing resources means you can share the resources so whatever resources you have with respect to network server storage application services that you can share so it's a demand based model where you can share the resources and finally that can be rapidly provisioned and released so both the things you can deploy it you can release it so cloud is nothing but a type of IT infrastructure hosted somewhere uh, because this is a shared IT infrastructure so what is the good thing here, uh, about this that uh, they can give this particular resource is a company A, B and C say this is with respect to cloud we can think like this now a particular client A can deploy their services and then it can release in no time or in very less time so that is the overall definition of the cloud computing let me stop here I hope you can understand what is the cloud computing what is the data center when we are talking about the cloud so suppose this is the cloud from where we are taking the resources and once we use that resource after that we can undeploy it okay something something you can say that demand based type of thing but inside the cloud obviously you have some sort of infrastructure and obviously like you can think this as a data center now inside that particular infrastructure they can use any form of virtualization automation uh, you can say the software defined network etc but uh, still they need some hardware say related to network related to the storage related to see virtualization so whatever things will be there they need some hardware here you can see the model or the abstract of a data center where you can see that we have various components so first of all you have the floor and if you ever went inside the data center you know that they have some raised floor it depends that inside that also they can keep the UCS or power backups or they have some somewhere in the corner they can put the power backup primary and secondary power supply then obviously you have a very strict entrance room uh, you need different type of access level to enter the room because inside the data center you have so many devices and they are running 24 by 7 by 365 into say 10 or 20 or 15 years so at that uh, for these for those purposes you need proper cooling system okay so this is the overall model of a data center and if you see what is the definition of data center it says special facility conceived to house manage and support critical compute resources we know about this critical compute resources they are something uh, called say network storage servers application etc so to put all these critical resources compute resources you need a particular uh, area or a particular data center so that is termed as a data center okay and obviously for cloud also we need data center now here are some definitions about the power backup system you can take a reference from this particular slide what about the entrance room telecommunication room cooling system obviously you need a good cooling or AC system to cool all the devices all the time then we have rakes uh, generally 42U rake is the standard but it depends that what type of device what what type of port density you have according to that you need rakes or patch panels or cabling all sort of infrastructure you need finally you can see here the raised floor okay so just uh, hold on check the definitions and we are very much good for this particular section what are the common cloud character characteristics and these are the common cloud characteristics now these things are also true for the IT infrastructure as well but everything that we are doing here we can think this with respect to cloud so whatever IT infrastructure uh, we want to elaborate or we want to work on uh, we can think this as a, these, th these type of things inside the cloud okay so cloud characteristics are that 
they can provide on demand self service we'll see that in this particular course rapid elasticity resource pooling measured service broad network access now these things can do with the your it infrastructure as well okay remember these things so whatever we are studying about the cloud means how we can send the resource request to the cloud and once we get all those resources then after that how we can undeploy it or we can cancel this that is different thing okay means that is how a user interact with the cloud but inside the cloud or inside your premises you can use these technologies okay so let us discuss more about the on demand self service and we can compare this with my infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure so suppose if you want some sort of services in your infrastructure what are the restriction you have to go for your technical uh, team then that technical team they will check with the contracts do we have contact with the third party or the isp if there is provisioning inside that contract you will get the resource but again the it team has to deploy say in terms of servers storage networking and then the user will get it so here we have the complete life cycle inside our infrastructure but now when we are talking about the cloud inside the cloud how they will provide doesn't matter but the thing is that i need that resource could you please deploy it the cloud will reply yes you have your server your storage your networking you can get it okay so here you can understand the way or the approach that how we are sending the request how we are getting the requ request that is different thing but how the infrastructure built in inside the cloud is different thing okay so please do not compare these things otherwise uh, uh, generally people has some a misconcept or they think oh what is cloud then what is my infrastructure like uh, these type of feelings will come then rapid elasticity suppose if you have to expand uh, your branch for example you have one branch other branch just you want for testing purpose you have started your business in some new branch you want to check the capabilities again it will go inside a life cycle means you need the resources you need say server storage compute services applications all sort of the stuffs you need you need complete project life cycle that is the rigidity in the it but in terms of say cloud you can send one request you have all those things you have your server storage network application everything you will get within fraction of say hours <laughs> not second but yeah, minutes okay so th that is the uh, use of the consumption model you want it you'll get it okay uh, in this section finally let us discuss about the resource pooling now again and again i i am telling you that this can be your infrastructure as well okay means you are using the resource Uh, resources properly or not means sometimes what happen that say for a company i have dedicated resource so one one of the branch say i'll take this as a branch here it is written as a company so one of the branch in say arizona i have dedicated say server storage networking device say one branch in phoenix for that also i have dedicated server storage and network that is the common practice in the traditional network but when we are talking about the resource pooling that means you have your infrastructure somewhere this can be cloud this can be yours and inside this infrastructure at as per need basis so generally in modern days now we have something called tenant for the organization so i have one tenant that is nothing but a logical representation of say organization or group of uh, things you can say or some sort of elements okay so tenant 1 i have tenant 2 i have according to what fabric access or what level of access tenant 1 and 2 has they will get it so they will get virtual server virtual storage virtual network virtual server storage and virtual network means this is abstracted 
from the actual hardware that I have here in the resource pool. Now according to the need, I have these virtual devices, I have these virtual devices and I can work on. And that is that inside the cloud they are working. So inside the cloud they will provide you all those things but they are doing the resource pooling. So that's why according to the signed agreement from the consumer to the cloud provider they are providing different different say compute with respect to different different clients. Let us discuss rest of the characteristics. We have measured services. Now what does it mean by measured service? It's actually very easy. Now suppose you have this cloud and you have purchased service say A, B and C but you don't have any mechanism that how much percentage of A, B and C you have used inside the cloud. You must measure those services that you have purchased from the cloud until unless how could you pay them correctly. Say after three months you come to know that C is underutilized or maybe B is for example overutilized then how could be the billing cycle? Maybe you think that oh the service C I haven't used but still I am paying. So that means we need a proper measured service for the cloud services. Now what is the problem with these type of measured services that do you have proper visibility of the network or not? That is the key concept here. So if you have proper visibility, if you have proper monitoring tools, then only you can measure all the services or measure the application or ser services that you have hosted over the cloud. Here in this diagram you can see that say I have services over one time frame it is something like 30% used. It is something like 25% used. But in other time slot it is say more than 100 or maybe 100% used. If I have major services, if I have visibility tools, monitoring tools, then I can set some common principle or rules. Okay, this much, this much, this much, for this much, this much, this much time frame I need to utilize. Okay? Now the other characteristic, this is the last one, is the broad network access and this is again very important cloud service we have. These cloud providers, say for example AWS, they have their visibility across the globe. They may have I think more than 21 presence across the globe but you need to check the sheet. But, but yeah, if you have the broader network access that means the end user they also have the visibility. So suppose if they want to use some services, this is company called ABC. It is situated somewhere in the India. But it, it has server in USA. So if this cloud has visibility inside India, obviously first it will go to India and then it will get that service or applications, whatever it is looking for. Now Suppose if you don't have visibility in India, what will happen? You will go search the USA server and then you will come back from there. Now doing this, what will happen you know? Doing this, you can drastically increase the latency and jitter and all those stuffs, that delay stuffs because now your packet will go via more number of hops inside the cloud to reach to the USA server. Okay, so if you have clustering in terms of serv uh, servers, if you have primary, secondary backup servers or data centers, say one is in US, one is in India. So whatever the nearest, say, branch or nearest head office or nearest consumer is there, they will request to the nearest resources and they will get the response. In that way, the latency and the jitter and all those delay counters can be minimized inside the cloud. Okay, so that is one of the, one of the common principle of the cloud computing that they have they have broad access or not. Okay, then let us discuss about the multi tenancy because so many times we are very confused about okay tenancy and multi tenancy. What is actual use of tenancy multi tenancy? 
why it is very important at the moment say in the software defined network and in the cloud computing actually it is important why first of all let us understand what does it mean by tenant so if i am telling tenant what does it mean the tenant is nothing but a logical entity that can represent say a group so group of organization it can represent or it can represent a department department say hr or sales or any other department or it can be any logical entity okay so tenant is nothing but abstraction over physical layer so whatever physical fabric access you have so you have something say access a layer where you have your physical resources and you can add fabric as well so you have a stretchable access layer on the top of that you can create logical containers those logical containers can represent a group of organization or department etc that is one tenant now suppose i am inside one organization say this is my organization my organization name is say a and for hr sales and it so h for hr is as a sales and then it i have three tenant likewise somewhere in some other company called b they have their tenants like hr sales and it and suppose somewhere down the line again some third company c they also have their tenant hr sales and it that is with respect to the companies now all these companies they request some resources from the cloud okay now because cloud now in this cloud they have the slice or they have a tenant say for a they have tenant for b they have tenant for c so from tenant a they can serve a company a which has their own tenant called sales uh, hr sales and it like b will serve b where they have their own tenant like h hr sales and it and c as in okay so you have the tenant concept not only in the cloud but you have inside the organization as well and that's why it is a multi tenant concept and so very important concept okay finally in this particular recording i have to cover this classifying the clouds we'll learn more about classifying the clouds in the upcoming sessions we have two criteria one is the service model one is the deployment model in service model we have infrastructure as a service that is iaas platform as a service that is paas and then software as a service that is saa Yes, we'll see that. Uh, what does it mean, and what are the practical examples of that? Then, inside deployment model, we have public, private, community, or hybrid uh, clouds. And it's very important. There are some plus and minus of public. There are some plus minus of private. There are some good and some cost-effective things with hybrid as well. Okay. So let us stop here. This is the last topic in this particular section around the corner is i cloud scale application and devop this is nothing but you can say the waterfall model that we studied in our uh, say engineering career or maybe in bca we have this particular model where we start say with analyze plan design build test operation inside operation again we have that the same life cycle so whenever a particular project is uh, go on live before that what are the things that we are doing so what we are doing we are going to the customer premises we are analyzing their requirement according to their requirement what will be the it infrastructure we needed means how much applications they have how much storage they need what is the network services all sort of things and plus by the end of day what is the uptime and what is the 
service what you can say that uh, what is the operational things they they are looking for operational things means what type of service level agreement i have with them in terms of suppose if some network down is there uh, or all other stuff so let me make this easy so service level agreement is nothing but according to priority or severity say p1 to p4 how our technical team will react to those things once it will come into the operation okay but before that obviously we need to analyze we need to plan and design this will again will take so many things while we'll design then how to build and all these models sh should be recursive in nature uh, that means that say once you design it doesn't mean that again you will not come back and redesign so if any requirement is there or may we say if you have design failure then you have to come back and then again you have to plan and design and then build and test and then operate so these life cycles are iterative means it will go and it will come back it will go and it it will come back let me show you this particular process so here you can see that inside the project timeline once i start with analyze and plan you can see design build test this is cyclic means once you design build test again you have to design build test means if you have any flaws or uh, if any other requirement come during the design phase or during during the build or test phase you need to change that once you change again it will go into the cycle okay then second you can see that customer turnover now suppose you had designed a network but due to some reason customer network has expanded again you need all those things like uh, you you again have to go inside the life cycle analyze plan design build test design uh, build test and then operate according to the given sla parameters then uh, if there is some technology upgradation or innovation so suppose cisco from nexus 7k they move to nexus 9k or some other automation or sdn product they introduce into the market then your design should ether those changes means your design should be in a such a fashion that they can accommodate the customer turnover our customer requirement they can accommodate the technology innovations as well okay these things are the requirements here we can uh, just pause, stop the recording or pause the recording not just stop pause the recording and you can just check that what is the phases and what are the definitions for analyze plan design build test and operate okay now again so uh, finally we come to a point in a conclusion that your design or your phases are in such a way that they can accommodate customer requirement as and when if it is changing uh, my design should be like that that again it will it can do the implement and operate correct so what is the requirement here it's very important to understand that's why this cisco devices they are trending in the market because these devices has a huge capability even if you see a normal cisco catalyst switch it can it can do n number of task okay so that means that devices are capable enough that if you expand the network it, it can expand now for example when it is coming to technology innovation say cisco has iOS XE in some of the routers this iOS XE it's itself a big platform that suppose if there is technology innovation it can accommodate all those innovations inside it okay now we are uh, discussing this with respect to cloud now where all these things will fit inside the cloud remember i told you inside cloud also you have the data center okay and these rules these principle can apply inside the data center of a particular cloud as well and even they are using the same type of waterfall uh, waterfall model inside the cloud as well hi everyone welcome to chapter number 
in this particular chapter we'll learn about say service provider what is service level agreement cloud providers we have various examples of cloud say infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or say software as a service so these type of cloud applications or these type of infrastructure within the cloud for our premises we can use how we can use all these things uh, we'll learn in this particular chapter number two or in this particular section so let us start with first thing that is the service provider and information technology now when it is coming to service provider if you see your organization you will find n number of service provider n number of vendors from where we are taking all these services now these vendors including say from uh, a toilet paper to something like we are getting some sort of uh, telecommunication service provider or network uh, network service provider means for each and everything inside our premises we used to take services and for that we have vendors so if you see here in this particular example you'll find that okay for telecommunication say for telecommunication i have telecommunication providers such as AT&T Verizon so for storage we have some providers something like EMC or NetApp for computer uh, service provider we may have Dell or HP or HCL for that we have internet service provider so whatever local internet service provider in that area even we can include say AT&T or some other service uh, service provider vendors as well in this then we have primary and secondary data center service provider good example may be IBM or HCL or any other big companies who are supporting the compute environment within the infrastructure managed service again we can think this as a say entity or maybe uh, IBM or HCL Wipro they are providing this managed service uh, infrastructure or maybe remote service infrastructure so what is happening generally the big companies uh, they run their application and for operation or you can say the operational uh, things uh, they are giving that services to some third party okay so that third party will manage all those network infrastructure all those say storage infrastructure everything so this will be the one layer before they meet to the actual vendor so what is happening let me uh, draw here in the layered approach so suppose this is the organization now once this organization has deployed the services for different different services they hired say managed service enterprise network so they have some contact with say MSEN and they acquire that service now what happened if any problem with this organization directly MSEN team that service provider who is managing the services they are interacting now if they are capable enough to resolve the problem it's okay otherwise if they are not then they are opening a tag case or vendor specific case say for, with Cisco say for a storage they will open with NetApp say for compute if have some IBM vendor they can um, open a CAS, uh, case sorry with IBM so for networking Cisco for storage some other vendor for a data center they have some other vendors like that okay here you can check the details about all these vendors so what you can do you can just pause the recording and you can read through all these things and you'll find it very much familiar because in day-to-day -day, uh, say infrastructure life we are finding all these terms okay so let me stop here and in the next section we'll discuss about the service level agreement next we have service level agreement service level agreement is nothing but agreement between you and service provider upon some certain criteria so what are those criteria those criteria are say performance uptime MTTR that is mean time to recover and customer data handling 
what does it mean by performance performance is nothing but the number of operation that service provider must guarantee in a time interval that is very important in a time interval with the offered capacity these two things are very uh, important when we are talking about the performance so performance is nothing but the operation with respect to time interval and capacity okay next is the up time generally we are talking that my isp has up time say 99.99% or maybe triple nine or five nine so up time is nothing but the uh, it, it's a measure of the amount of time it system must work correctly so how long your it systems are working properly that is the up time so suppose if some of the services are hosted to the service provider so how long that can be hosted there should very minimum downtime or if you want a good uptime you may have primary and backup data center or primary or backup systems okay then third we have mttr mean time to recover that uh, what is the time frame in in that that particular system that particular failed system will recover that is mean by the mean time to recover finally customer data handling this is again very important because uh, there should be some rule or there should be some strategy upon which the service provider they will provide the agreement in terms of data confidentiality and backup so your cia confidentiality integrity authenticity should be maintained and obviously your deletion policies or your data privacy all these things will be maintained okay so these are the key terms for a sla performance uptime uh, mttr and customer data handling next in this we have the cloud provider so we have already discussed that if you are asking or if you are raising some request from the cloud inside the cloud you have different different services offered so we have a storage obviously we want uh, we know that a storage is something related to say a storage area network or a storage where a client can store their database inside the server or whenever we have uh, generally we are telling this server to a storage communication so whenever you have server to a storage communication your servers can save the data and generally what servers saving the data in the storage those are the client request information or client information so client information first it is uh, saved inside server and then it can be replicated inside your storage or uh, your storage has the saving capabilities inside the storage both thing can work it depend upon what type of storage you have in your infrastructure but when we are talking about the cloud so directly from server i can store my data inside the cloud storage then then obviously we have networking they are doing the networking task later in this course we'll learn about say csr or some virtual routers on that we'll see that how they can do this uh, networking over these virtual routers or over these virtual devices then they can provide the desktop services the streaming some audio and video capabilities they will provide some web services they can host application they can provide application services they can provide database services now these three things are quite new here the collaboration tools publishing and the middleware so let me show you the definition of all these series here in this particular ppt you will get the definitions of all these so when we are talking about the middleware it's a supplementary software including libraries programming language interpreters database services user authentication service account management and so forth okay so it's in the middle which is providing the libraries and binaries for different different applications then coming to collaboration as the name suggests collaboration is nothing but collective effort you can say or the joint work uh, from different different people one of the good example is share sharepoint microsoft sharepoint is uh, one of the collaboration tool 
where different people can work and share their uh, Excel or Word or other documents inside the SharePoint. Then the publishing application that facilitates the publication of text such as blogs. So blog is one of the example. Uh, even companies they have their own publishing tool. And they have their own actually customized publishing tool, collaboration tools. All they are using in one. Say some of the companies they are using Yammer as a publishing tool. So different members in a team they can create their uh, their Yammer group and they can publish their say videos, audios, uh, writing notes, all these things. Okay. And then finally we have a streaming that is again I already told you that is the audio video features and the capabilities. So we are very good. Let's just stop here. Let us talk about Infrastructure as a Service or IAAS. You can use this PISA as a service as an analogy that in the traditional network what you have in the IAS, what you have in platform as a service, why you have, what you have in software as a service, what you have. But in coming two to three lectures, we'll discuss more about all these analogy. Let us start with infrastructure as a service. As you can see here that this blue one is the provider responsibility. So what the provider will provide you? Provider will provide you virtualization, server, storage, networking and you can think like this, okay, you have virtual server, you have virtual storage, you have virtual network, but you are not bothered about what that particular service provider is providing to you. Then what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to run the application over your operating system over your infrastructure software. Okay, so here you can see that some portions the service provider is providing and basically these are the compute thing like server storage and network and for things related to say operating system and the application you are responsible. One of the major player in this particular domain is uh, everyone knows that that is the Amazon and AWS is the one of the major player in this, you can see here in the Gartner Quadrant that AWS is leading, although Microsoft is also following up AWS, but the market share is too high of AWS with respect to any other vendors. Now, if we, if we talk about this AWS, initially we have talked about the uh, broad network access or network capability. You can see here, that AWS they have visibility across the globe and this uh, in AWS term you can see here that they have regions and they have zones so inside region they have zone 1 and zone 2 like that this zone you, this zone you can think as a data center so suppose uh, I'm talking about a particular region say US region suppose in US region I have for example zone 1 and zone 2 that means in US region I have two data center, one can work as a primary, one can work as a secondary. Suppose if the customer is here, say this is the customer and it's near to say India, then it will not go to any Europe or uh, US server for their fulfillment because in um, doing that, uh, its latency, jitter delay, everything will increase. So if it is near to India, it will query to Indian server and it will get the response. Okay, so that's why we need some sort of global availability or in cloud term that is the broad network access. Now AWS, if you do the AWS course, you'll find that they have more than thousand services or applications offered inside the cloud. Um, and these are the you can say the number of services they are providing but inside say game development again you will get some sort of applications and things okay so let me show you quickly in this particular slide that what are the main services they are offering so they are offering services related to a storage and let me start from the beginning so first of all they have some something called AWS global infrastructure 
on the top of that we have all the services so on the top of that we have compute database mobile services management tools for the visibility they have messaging tools developer tools security storage blah 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 all type of things the new things they have added artificial intelligence internet of things at the moment in present this artificial intelligence is trending very very high and you can think that next IT market in coming say 3 to 10 years is purely inside artificial intelligence and at the moment this internet of things is also peaking very high so we have current business or marketed for uh, internet of things as well so these are the IT these are the technology where IT is trending at the moment okay so inside these all these things say if we are talking about compute you can see here inside compute we have services like uh, EC2 EC2 container service lightest all number of services will find say inside storage we have simple storage solution like S3 then elastic file system glacier storage gateway in database we have relational database management say in networking and content delivery we have virtual private cloud cloud front route 53 so all sorts of applications we have inside AWS here uh, I have listed a few of the services and the definition you can have a look on that say EC2 so what EC2 will provide EC2 will provide you cloud service that provide virtual services that are fully controlled by AWS user resize according to requirement of compute demand because obviously this is what compute EC2 is elastic compute okay and it offers all sort of operating systems EC2 enables robustness through the regions and the ability zone so remember we have the reason we have the ability zone you can correlate with the data center okay and then they are providing security things related to uh, cloud and that is interacting with the customer such as VPN and other security uh, protocol supported then we have the storage so uh, if you want to remember all these things because there are uh, quite a bit in number so you can think like to run a data center what you need you need network you need a storage solution you need management for visibility so you need ma management tool you need obviously you need compute but you need compute with respect to all of these obviously you need security so with respect to all these things you will find the applications inside AWS so some of the applications are related to storage uh, S3, EVS, EFS some of them are related to networking that is the virtual uh, private cloud it is actually for networking because generally this AWS you can term AWS as a public cloud but inside that public cloud you can mix with your private infrastructure so at that time this uh, term this will make AWS as a private cloud later we will learn about the features of public and uh, private cloud then it will be it will become easier to you to understand there are some other features as well like direct connect suppose if you want direct tunnel from yours to the AWS with this feature you can have that then we have elastic load balancing we know what is the importance of load balancing even we have uh, one dedicated chapter for load balancing we'll see that that how load balancing uh, supporting the uh, balancing between the user request and the avail available servers inside the data center and then finally we have root 53 so this 53 is nothing but DNS port number so from there they had derived this root 53 and obviously this is the DNS service inside the AWS so these are the few of the services inside AWS but you can see here that we have so many features in this particular uh, AWS and it is one of the example of infrastructure as a service next we have platform as a service here you can see in the diagram that inside infrastructure as a service the provider responsibility was to provide you up to this layer 
but in case of uh, platform as a service you can see that operating system plus the infrastructure software will be provided by the provider now what is the responsibility of the consumer that they can run their application on the top of infrastructure provided by the uh, provider now it's very important here to understand that this type of uh, cloud or this type of offering is done from Microsoft one of the leading inside platform as a service provider and here also you can see that they have this much of uh, global presence okay so across the globe they have their data centers from there they can provide such uh, such sort of say plot, a platform as a service services it's very easy you can go and you can create your trial version just to verify that what type of services there in their microsoft azure portal uh, you can go and log to httpsportal.azure.com you can create your account so once you create account then so the thing is that go to azure.com so the thing is that first of all log to azure.com it will redirect it to this portal.azure.com anyways once you create your account then you will get a nice tour it will show you that okay do you want to create your resources from here you can create the resources then you have the list of services the top services are here but you have the list of services now coming to these services you can see here we have services related to database we have services related to virtual machine virtual machines uh, that that means we have supported operating systems such as say, linux windows and other operating systems as well you can you can verify that then you can see that we have load balances we have a storage we have virtual network we have active directory monitoring advisory security so whatever things are applicable for infrastructure as a service you will get all sort of information or services inside this portal further you can move you can have this nice search bar where you can search whatever you want to search then finally uh, you have this notification you have help plus support you have a directory and the subscription and then uh, about the account information okay so very much is something like if you know about that technology you have to click and you have to use that service that's it because everything is provided by the service provider and uh, what you are doing you are hosting your application and that is the use case of platform as a service the final topic in this section is software as a service so far what we have studied that inside infrastructure as a service the provider responsibility is up to virtualization say in the platform as a service the provider responsibility is to provide up to infrastructure software and finally inside say software as a service the provider responsibility is to provide everything okay so what as a user or consumer you will do you have a username and password you can simply log to that particular service and you can use it the best example for this is say cisco webex the other example are say google doc as well so here you can see google doc and cisco webex but there are n number of services we are using for this simply we have one username and password and we can use it next we have say anything as a service what does it mean to this cloud uh, evolution what is happening now the providers they are adding anything as a service so x they can replace this means this become the place holder and suppose here you can see desktop as a service so if a cloud provider makes infrastructure as a service with a say software as a service then they can provide something called daas that is desktop as a service likewise if you see here that the service provider they add infrastructure as a service and say software as a service and they can provide something called disaster recovery as a service so anything they can mix and finally they will come as a as a service acronym something like that 
Some other examples are here you can see. Other examples are uh, backup as a service where again SaaS included with uh, IAS cloud they will provide backup as a service then we can see IP telephony as a service then you can see VPN as a service so everything they can mix means two particular cloud they can mix and they can create one particular service let us start chapter number three in this particular chapter we will learn about public cloud private cloud Hybrid, hybrid clouds and some other terminology we will see that how Cisco uh, take uh, itself in, inside the cloud because say, Cisco is not known for their cloud services so how and what type of Cisco cloud services are available we will check in this particular chapter so let us first start with public cloud now when we are talking about public cloud obviously what will happen with help of public cloud that you will find it available everywhere means it has the highest availability no problem on that it will be available but with some uh, uh, pros it has some cons as well so what are the disadvantages and what are the advantages we have with respect to public cloud let us see one by one uh, say risk and challenges so what risk and challenges we have with the public cloud because we are dealing with the public cloud we may have data loss and that in case of outage of major hardware failure in the cloud de uh, deployment we may have that so if there is data loss because it's a public cloud then it's very difficult to measure at what point we have data loss likewise because we are dealing with the public say remember public public means that you don't have much control over it so once you are dealing with the public cloud at that time suppose if you have data breach if you have data loss then you have very less access or you have very, uh, very less privileges to determine all these things apart from that because we are dealing with the public cloud again what about the malicious insider very very difficult to figure out that as well because whenever the service relies upon the uh, employees at that time say some human motiv motivations and some other stuffs can cause this malicious insiders then you can see because again it's a cloud interface it, it is one of the most unsecure interface because you are exposed to the cloud so public interface exposed to the cloud so that's why uh, insecure interface again account of traffic hijacking this is again one important point maybe your sessions will be hijacked because you, your traffic is going towards the public cloud and finally the shadow IT what's the definition about this if employees from your company deploy resources in the cloud without uh, without knowing the age of the IT department uh, confidential may be wrongly so, so what happens is sometimes we have uh, some of the confidential data that we don't want to store in the public cloud say some sort of uh, government data some sort of very important financial data but due to lack of knowledge if your employee store in the public cloud that will be data policy breach or data breach these are the risks uh, involved in the public cloud now there is again one uh, problem with the public cloud that how you will control the cloud so let us discuss the uh, control challenges as well here you can see the first of the control challenge is the data location so where is my data located do I have very minimum latency to retrieve that data because if the data is located in some other place in uh, some other uh, say, uh, data center uh, its geographical location is some far place at that time it's very difficult to control the data location again what is the flexibility or the elasticity of the control means how much control you have to access your data then uh, service admissions so you can see here in the service admission that uh, an administrative account may issue request for a specific public cloud services that are not authorized by the IT department so do we have proper privilege for that data for uh, uh, that say cloud control uh, 
परफॉर्मेंस मॉनिटरिंग से इफ यू डू नॉट हैव परफॉर्मेंस मॉनिटरिंग हाउ कुड यू मेजर दैट से सर्विसेज ए बी सी दे आर यूजिंग प्रॉपर रिसोर्सेज इन साइड द क्लाउड सो दिस परफॉर्मेंस मॉनिटरिंग इज ऑल्सो वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू मेजर द परफॉर्मेंस इन साइड द क्लाउड finally end to end management so what does it mean by end to end management say in companies we have generally different line of businesses we have different different departments now uh, then the problem comes into this then how you can manage the uh, services or manage the resources inside different different line of businesses inside different different departments so these are the things that you know it's very difficult to control inside the public cloud now coming to the cost risk although we know that yeah if we are using the public cloud at that time the cost will be less because why uh, we uh, because we are using the public cloud because we are using some sort of resource infrastructure so obviously cost will be less but there should be some hidden cost that we don't know so we don't know at the moment that these services we are not using still the service provider is charging for these services we don't know about the service uh, proliferation that means that without proper control of deployed resources a company invariably allows sprawl of cloud services that are barely used means you don't know that you are using these services and you are paying for these services even if you are not using those services you are paying for that okay loss of revenue may be there why loss of revenue due to poor application performance because i don't have proper monitoring for the application i don't know the outcome of a application means what is the performance analysis and how the application is performing so at that time we may have loss of revenue the other important thing is the cost modeling and the forecasting dealing with the public clouds at that moment of time at that point we don't know about the cost model means which application in future needs some more bandwidth needs uh, more compute respect to application storage network those things we don't know so how we can forecast a particular application inside a public cloud that is again a revenue related thing finally the business focus some of the ceos they want some standard services so whatever we are using in the cloud next year they can say okay uh, we are not achieving our goal and then do not use this so at that time how you know according to business focus they will take some decision then how we can author or how we can uh, what you can say that accommodate such type of situation inside the public cloud that is again one type of cost risk okay let us move further so now you understand these type of risk involved in a public cloud and we will see that these risk can be solved in in terms of private cloud that we'll discuss in the next section in public cloud we have discussed that we have challenges with respect to cost and control so cost and control we have to you know compromise various things with respect to say uh, cost and control but while using private cloud obviously it will be more secure than public cloud because here this is private to the organization but there are some things that we need to discuss here or we need to uh, compromise here as well in the private cloud because it will be more expensive than the public cloud that we will see so one of the emulation that we have in terms of how we can build a uh, private cloud inside a public cloud is amazon aws so amazon aws is a public cloud inside that they have one a uh, service called virtual private cloud vpc which is very popular at the moment in the market with help of this particular vpc we can have a private cloud that is obviously virtual private cloud inside the public infrastructure now it depends whenever you are using a particular private cloud it depends that oh, what is your expectation what is your uh, outcome what 
uh, what is your expected outcome with respect to this particular server and you have to check on the parameters of hardware software plus you have to check in the parameters of security control and cost risk okay uh, one thing I want to uh, point out here that this uh, virtual private cloud means that is emulated inside the public cloud is not fully private cloud so that you have to think again you have to think uh, that what is the baseline difference between complete private cloud and then you are using virtual private cloud okay but this still this virtual private cloud from Amazon is really really very hot in the market and so many organizations they are using it now if we are using the public cloud so obviously we have some sort of benefit so let me highlight what is the major uh, difference between public and the private cloud so suppose if I am using the public cloud obviously public cloud has broad network access with respect to private cloud so here it will win then again if we check what is the operational cost or what is the capital expenditure again you will find that public cloud uh, will less cheaper than the private cloud because for private cloud obviously you have to pay more for the services again for the elasticity also because this is a public cloud so public cloud can elastic more than the private cloud so these things you have to keep in the mind and that's why VPC when it is coming into the picture it is giving uh, it is giving the feature of both the public and the private so that's why we have all these check marks inside Amazon VPC finally let us check what are the examples for uh, most popular uh, private cloud you can see here Cisco is coming into the market with Cisco one enterprise suit and we'll discuss this uh, in the upcoming sections that what are the components inside the Cisco One Enterprise Cloud Suite apart from that we have Microsoft Azure we have VMware vCloud Suite and then we have OpenStack as a open source so these are the private clouds present at the moment let us continue our study about the cloud next we have community and hybrid cloud now we have seen that we have pros and cons for both the public and the private clouds then we have the other option that we can use the community cloud let me show you the diagram community cloud means few of the organization they can use shared resource inside the cloud now what is the loophole or what is the problem with such type of community cloud that it has a scale limit so you can see here that uh, this community cloud are suitable to a relatively small number of companies from industry represented by common interest of compliance standard that means it can't scale much so that's why we need some sort of hybrid cloud so let us see here what are the advantages and disadvantages of the public and the private cloud although we have already discussed this but again uh, let us list out all these advantages and disadvantages first with the public cloud you can see the advantage is OPEX model scale high accessible the disadvantage is shared resource less secure weaker control that we have already discussed with respect to private cloud we have dedicated hardware more secure customizable but the disadvantage that they are expensive they are less scalable hard to standardize okay so we have plus and minus for both the public and the private cloud so better we will use such type of model that we can use both the features of public and private cloud and yes we can use that so here in the diagram you can see that from private cloud I have some sort of secure tunnel we'll see this type of secure tunnel and what is the name of secure tunnel and what type of connection I have in between the private and public cloud we'll see in the upcoming sections but here you can see that we have some sort of secure connection between the private and the public cloud and then we can use the features of both the public and the private clouds this is the last recording in this section and we'll discuss about Cisco intercloud 
Cisco InterCloud simply means that uh, what is the Cisco approach that we can connect the various clouds. Before discussing that, let us discuss that what type of technologies we have at the moment along with the cloud. One of the a uh, neat technology we have is bring your own device means uh, you can come with the roaming devices once you are inside the premises automatically your device will get ip and that will connect to the network that is the bring your own device the other important research area at the moment is the internet of things now how this internet of things is going to be uh, implemented inside the cloud or how uh, a particular uh, company or a particular organization can interact with Internet of Things devices plus the data that is again one uh, one huge topic at the moment in the IT. Now this, this particular Internet of Things actually they are some devices where we are putting the sensors inside that sensor we are running some uh, some sort of say uh, Internet or you can say some sort of operating system which is capable of being monitored by some cloud-based or maybe some uh, IoT-based directors. One of the director is a FOG. FOG is one of the director uh, from where you can monitor all the IoT-based devices because these IoT-based devices they are sending their uh, request and reply and their processing data uh, in, in, in the form of the sensors because these sensors they are delivering the data and all the stuff uh, inside that in the IoT. Then we have this big data. Actually this is uh, one old concept. It's not very new concept, uh, the big data. Uh, one of the example of big data is the Hadoop. Uh, that is there to run or execute real-time data and you can have input in terms of mobility, social media, IoT. Means it is, it is there to process huge amount of data and huge amount of data that can be real-time data that we are using in the social media or Internet of Things or the uh, mobility data. Okay? So along with cloud, these things are also going parallel. Now let us discuss about this inter-cloud. So we are very much familiar about the Internet. What is Internet? Internet is nothing but it's a network of network. So many networks, when they are collecting, uh, collected together, they form one big network that is Internet. Likewise, this inter-cloud is nothing but it's a cloud of cloud. Means if so many clouds, they are clubbing together, they form inter-cloud. Now what is the Cisco take here? You can see here that Cisco uh, with the partner clouds, they can connect with the enterprise private cloud they can connect with the public clouds and again we have this uh, cloud inter inter cloud services so that they are going in hand in hand like that hand on hand means you can connect seamlessly between private to public cloud uh, with some sort of technology we'll discuss in this particular section what are the technologies used to do this interconnect and let me show you the diagram then you will understand First of all, these are the terminologies used for the interconnection. So we have Cisco InterCloud Fabric, that is ICF. We have Cisco InterCloud Fabric Director. So we have ICF, means we have Cloud Fabric. And then to monitor, to track all the instances to all the services inside that fabric, we have Cloud Director. We have Cloud Extender. We'll see that we have ICS as well, that is the Cloud Switch. Then we have Virtual Security Gateway, VSG. And then we have obviously the cloud-based uh, routers, something like CSR. So let me show you the diagram. See in the diagram that I am extending uh, the cloud. So suppose I have one cloud here, I have other cloud here. And in between that, we have this inter-cloud extender. I am extending the cloud from one place to other place. Then I have secure tunnel means to exchange the data of the VMs from one cloud to the other cloud we have secure data and secure data tunnel and not only that you can see here that between this ICS and the VMs we have secure tunnel between this ICS and CSR we have secure tunnel between this ICS and the security gateway we have the secure tunnel okay so once I am extending the uh, data or once I am extending the cloud from one cloud, say public cloud to private cloud, these things will be there. 
Now, what are the main terminology used in our case? You can see here that I have intercloud fabric director. With help of director, I can interact the management plane of VM. Uh, we'll learn more about this VM and how this VM management server works. One of the VM management server is uh, vSphere server, or vSphere client. We'll see that in the upcoming session. So from this director, I can interact with the VM manager. From this director, I can interact with uh, the cloud switch or inter-cloud switch. With this director, I can a create tunnel between the cloud extender and the cloud switch. So all sort of stuffs we can do with help of this particular director. And here you can see the list of the uh, services that this particular cloud fabric director can do. Let me list all those things. So establish a management connection to the server virtualization control. That is the VM, Virtual Machine Manager, from your organization to the VM Manager. That is the one task. The other task is configure the secure connection between public and private cloud. Good. Then add and manage the end users. That is again the, uh, the work of the director. Then configure policies that govern workloads so you can create the policies you can customize the portal you can monitor the hardware capacity and the utilization you will get nice a graph that from where you can uh, monitor the capacity and the utilization per user we have the service catalog feature to enable the end user for the provisioning of the services then finally we can configure the virtual server templates and image as well as the end user access to them okay so you can see that we can do lot many things so not only we can do the management we can create the secure connection we can add the users we can configure the policies, we can customize the portal, we can monitor the hardware, we can create the service catalog, we can configure the virtual service template. That will be the use of our director or say inter, inter cloud fabric director. Now we reach to chapter number four, behind the curtain. And this particular chapter, actually this is a very important chapter where you will understand about the cloud and how we can operate inside the cloud. Because, say, if we are talking about something uh, traditional IT infrastructure to reach up to cloud infrastructure, what are the key uh, goals or what is the major steps that we reach from a legacy IT infrastructure to the cloud? So you'll find, yeah, to reach to the particular cloud, you need consolidation virtualization, standardization, automation, orchestration. Okay, so these are, say if I count one, two, three, four, five, these are the five main pillars that can be performed to reach from a traditional network to fully automate cloud infrastructure or to reach up to cloud if that is your goal. Now, if you check your traditional network or if you check your network infrastructure, some sort of consolidation, some sort of virtualization, some sort of standardization, and now people are talking about automation. Means to reduce the overload of the manual operation, you can write a script that will be, that will be assumed like 100% error free, that you can run and execute the task inside the IT operations. The next phase is obviously the orchestration. For the or for orchestration, actually we have tools, something called UCS Director. We'll learn more about UCS Director in the upcoming sessions, recordings. Okay, but this is the overall goal to reach from the traditional network to, uh, to uh, reach up to the cloud infrastructure. Okay, now Cisco One, uh, more precisely we can say that this is something like Cisco One Enterprise Cloud Suite. Means it contains so many other features as well. This recording I will show you about Cisco Prime Service Catalog and different uh, components inside the Prime Catalog. But uh, in general, overall, if you see what is the over, overall overview of the uh, say Cisco Prime Service Catalog or Prime Service Catalog, 
So you will find that, okay, you are there in your traditional network, your goal is to integrate with the cloud infrastructure. Now this particular thing is the inside picture of the cloud infrastructure. This is cloud infra. Okay. Now we have three main parameters here. What are those three main parameters? So we have something called cloud portal and this is that I am mentioning that Cisco Prime Service Catalog. CPSC. I'll show you, I'll log into this and I'll show you that inside this cloud portal what you will find. So a end user, first of all it will log to the portal that is the uh, service catalog portal and from there it can integrate with UCS director. So this is uh, uh, cloud orchestrator. Uh, one example is UCS director and then you can measure the service. So inside UCS director, when I cover UCS, uh, UCS director, at that time uh, I'll show you that inside UCS director we have cloud meter as well. Okay, so from here you can reach to uh, cloud orchestrator and then you can province, uh, provision different type of services, say services like network, services like storage, services like virtualization, services like integration with VM manager. So all sort of services you will get uh, from your uh, service catalog and the UCS director. So you can think this as a cloud software stack. From cloud software stack you can interact with various IT infrastructure or here we have cloud infrastructure with respect to say network, storage, virtualization and VMware or VM manager. Okay. Now if you log to Cisco Prime Service Catalog it will look like this. So let me log inside this and let me show you some of the features. I logged inside and you can see that you have say first of all you have this welcome message that welcome to your IT as a service storefront Cisco Prime service catalog is the ITAS catalog providing self service for private and hybrid cloud so that is very important that we have self service for private and hybrid cloud okay and it can provide out of box integration for UCS director as well correct now if I scroll down here, you can see that I can integrate this particular cloud with enterprise IT service like Epic, private cloud infrastructure as a service. Then I can integrate with cloud computing services like Cloud Center, Amazon Web Service, Microsoft uh, Azure service. Then inside cloud services, you can see these are the operating systems. Uh, these are the applications inside private. Uh, cloud infrastructure, you can see servers deployed via UCS directory, Cisco Prime Service Catalog is a ITAS providing services, all those definitions. Then finally inside the ACI, we can create tenant in ACI, we can create three tier profile, we can deploy a new equipment, uh, deploy ACI to new equipment like that. Suppose if I click here, and here you can see that it's very much similar that you are purchasing something from Amazon. Correct. So what do you want? Order for others. Order. So see, suppose if I click order, then I will get new page. In this particular new page, it will ask about deploy ACI to new equipment. Yes, I want to submit it. Okay. So this is the way basically you can simply go to the catalog and whatever you want to deploy, you can deploy it. Okay. So I hope this particular section will uh, be very informative to you and you learn new things uh, from this video. I hope you understand the service catalog. The next topic is cloud orchestrator. Now this cloud orchestrator uh, can do so many things. And first of all, I will list all the application. Then I will log to UCS director that is one of the cloud orchestrator from Cisco. And then we'll match all these things that we are going to discuss here. Okay. So let me one by one highlight all these things that what my UCS director is capable of. Okay. So first of all, you can see here in the slide, it can manage and support heterogeneous data center. Okay. So not only one, 
but mix of data center it can support and then after you can see here that include compute network storage virtualization resource from multiple vendor so irrespective of cisco they can support netapp vmware emc other other vendors they can support we'll see that okay that is the one of the feature that heterogeneous data center so let me mark only this portion even you can note it down as well heterogeneous data center plus multiple vendor okay second it can provision physical and virtual compute layer 4 to 7 network services storage resources so again the second point is also very important that not only it can provision physical but virtual resources that is compute as well that is the second point so first point second point third create and implement single and multi tier application profile so it can create application profile that is the third so if we highlight it can support heterogeneous data center let me circle it with multiple vendor support it has then physical and virtual compute application profile fourth one define application container that describe a set of tier that include physical or virtual compute resources that connectivity policy communication policy you can further define those application containers so it can define application container okay so now we have four important point that heterogeneous data center multiple vendor provision of physical and virtual compute create and implement single and multi tenant say application profile define application container all these things i will show you uh, while logging to ucs director then establish multi tier environment you can see here so that users whether internal or your company or external can work only within the secure constraints of their own resource pool okay so it it can establish a secure multi tenant environment point number 5 implement metering so this metering is actually how you can uh, measure the services or how you can measure the resources that is the third pillar remember we have three uh, things in, inside our cloud stack so one was service catalog the second was orchestrator and third was metering how you are charging okay so inside this ucs directory we have both the option not only it can do the orchestration but it can do the metering plus very important thing it can do the automation as well so it can do the automation with the it resources and implement a process oriented approach okay so it can do the automation feature as well now let me log to ucs director and show you all these things inside ucs director and let me highlight you all these things so here you can see first of all inside the dashboard we can see so what are the things we can see so vm active versus inactive ucs server inventory ucs server associated versus unassociated so we have a dashboard here great then i can go and click to converged So if I go inside Converge, you will see the multi-vendor support of UCS Director. So not only it is supporting VMware virtualization. You can see uh, virtual VMware uh, shared vCenter. It is supporting a Cisco compute. It is supporting Cisco network. That is the VSM. Again, this is something like a virtual supervisor module, or we can define it. Uh, if you go. click here you can see yeah this is nexus 1000v vsm virtual supervisor module and we have two things we know that i think we know that we have uh, virtual supervisor module plus ethernet module so vim and vsm anyways then it is supporting netapp the storage as well so here you can see that the storage from netapp all these things we have here inside this converge if i go and check hyper converge so it is it has hyperflex and virtual san feature then here in the top you can see it is supporting virtual and physical resources as well 
So what are the things inside virtual? It is supporting virtual compute, storage, network. It is supporting physical compute, storage, network. So it's a compute, a storage, network with respect to virtual and physical. It is supporting. Then inside the organization, service catalog, approvals, summary, virtual resource, physical resource, chargeback. These chargebacks are actually very important. This is something like metering type of thing that is the third feature inside the cloud stack. Then finally, it can create policies. So you can see it can create application container that we have seen in the PPT. Then virtual hypervisor policies. So not only it can create the containers, but it can create the policies with respect to virtual service delivery, computer storage network. Again, uh, with respect to say physical infra infrastructure policy like uses manager central net app. Other thing. Okay. Then finally, uh, you can uh, administer this particular software based machine. So you have license system, LDAP integration and other stuffs. Now this cloud sense and the chargeback, these are the metering type of thing. So this cloud sense here and we have seen the chargeback as well. Okay, so this is the overall summary of our UCS director and I hope you understand the dashboard and the basic features inside this particular UCS director. In our cloud software stack, we have cloud meter. What is the use of cloud meter? The use case of the cloud meter that uh, we can see here that it concentrates uh, service management or measurement in a cloud computing deployment. Simply say we have three component. One is service catalog one is the orchestrator and one is the cloud meter. Now the use of cloud meter that whenever the orchestrator, so whenever we have request for deployment uh, to deploy something say in terms of physical or virtual, at that time cloud meter receive notification from the cloud orchestrator informing when infrastructure resources were provisioned for the cloud consumer. So it will receive the notification that a particular consumer has done something. Uh, obviously, it will receive the a notification from the orchestrator. That is the first goal. The second thing it has supports the creation of billing plan. The third, summarize a receive information, eliminates error such as duplicate data or some other parameters uh, such as generate on demand reports per user group business. So, uh, you can summarize like this, just for sake of simplicity, means it is one component inside the cloud stack, uh, which is used to receive the notification one, which is supporting the creation of billing plan two, summarize the receive information means it will summarize, uh, do you have uh, duplicate data, what is the actual bill for a particular uh, for a particular consumer or the customer and then finally provides on-demand report to the cloud portal okay so these are the use of the cloud meter and in short it is doing the measurement or measuring of various application or resources inside the cloud suit what are the uh, functions or which type of uh, application or modules we have inside say uh, UCS director to support this so inside UCS director we have chargeback module and we have cloud sense tab uh, we have seen in the last section that how it looks like if you go inside say UCS director and if you check this cloud sense if you click to the cloud sense then you will get list of billing plans so here you can see that application container report billing report for consumer then inventory report, utilization report, NetApp report, means all sort of reports we have with help of this particular cloud sense. Okay, and again we have this chargeback module, enable detailed visibility into the cost structure of the orchestrated cloud infrastructure. Okay, so I'm doing the summary here. This cloud meter will do nothing, but with help of chargeback, so chargeback and with help of say CloudSense, 
it will measure the services it will summarize the bill and it will receive the notifications okay so i hope uh, at this point of time you understand this particular uh, metering cloud metering uh, services and a use case when we are talking about the cloud journey cloud journey means that you are uh, moving your legacy it infrastructure to the cloud now to move from legacy infrastructure to the cloud you have five parameters or you have five stoppage you can say so first of all it will start with consolidation then it will move to virtualization then it will go to standardization then it will go to automation and finally we have the orchestration okay so one by one i am going to cover all these five parameters in this particular recording i will discuss about consolidation virtualization standardization and automation let us start with consolidation here you can see in this particular diagram you can see here that all the clients say client a b c they are using their own so yeah, they are using their own storage they are using their own server they have their own data center so customer a has data center a b has data center b c has data center c okay but suppose if we move all these infrastructure into uh, into the consolidated state so at that time you can see not only you have the redundancy from the servers to the uh, storage area network or towards the storage but you can share the resources so that is the overall goal uh, of consolidation is to share the resources so the first step towards the cloud integration or towards the cloud uh, uh, move or movement is to do the consolidation to properly share the resources okay now the second thing is virtualization and it's a huge concept virtualization one of the main, uh, main player inside the virtualization is vmware but now other companies they are also doing the virtualization if we see the evolution of virtualization virtualization is not a new concept means this virtualization is bit old because if we see say vlan vlan is a type of virtualization inside cisco say inside cisco nexus switch we have concept of vdc virtual device concept uh, con content or context that is also a type of virtualization if we are thinking about say asa firewall inside asa firewall as well you have context means you can create virtual asa firewall inside the firewall so this virtualization concept is not say a uh, new it's a old concept but uh, due to this vmware vmware has done tremendous work inside virtualization uh, initially they start with server virtualization then they move into other products as well then they move something like say data center virtualization their product is nsx then they move to sdn type of virtualization say for wide area network they also acquire some company so this virtualization is again a huge thing not only we have virtualization in terms of network we have virtualization in terms of storage we have virtualization in terms of server as well okay so this you can consider as second step to move towards the cloud and the third step is the standardization standardization is important because you need some uh, some sort of a standard model you need some sort of a standard parameter upon which you will define the resources upon which you will define the uh, compute you will define the storage okay so standardization will provide the uniformity inside the infrastructure say in terms of vendor model version storage server network everything okay so this is also very important that we are moving our legacy it infrastructure towards the cloud or we are doing the cloud integration finally we have automation this automation is uh, also uh, a huge uh, nowadays uh, maybe you heard from last 2 to 3 years everyone is learning python say ansible 
Perl. These type of languages are uh, means used by the network engineers. Means initially, say five years back or say six year back, uh, network engineers they are not worried or bothered about the programming languages. Now network engineers they start learning Python or other programming language or scripting language. Why? Because uh, that is one of the use case means automation use case to move the traditional infrastructure towards the cloud okay and that is one of the major milestone for a uh, legacy IT infrastructure okay now if we use the automation what type of benefits we'll get we'll get the benefit that uh, whatever human errors are there we can remove it that is the first thing. Second thing, whatever manual operations we used to do, we can run a script with that script. It will uh, do all those manual work that we used to do within a fraction of seconds or maybe minutes. Okay. So these are the two things that uh, with help of automation, we have the concept of reusability. We can write a code, we can write a template and time to time uh, without any human error, we can execute it. Okay, so we can remove the manual procedure, then automation, invariably transfer, uh, transform provisioning, migration, and decommissioner. Uh, there are so many good scripts are there. Say, suppose if you run those scripts, it will automatically do all sort of configuration. Okay, and then finally, you can see that. Uh, much as a modern industrial procedure line, the operational terms of an automated data center must design tasks that can be carried out. Uh, software robots closely monitor there. That means that in short, what you can do that you can write a procedure codes or a script to reduce the manual workload and you can gain the highest level of accuracy with help of automation. Okay, so let us stop here. In this session, I am going to explain what is orchestration, application programming interface, that is API, and the RESTful API. Now, this is the fifth pillar when we are reaching from our IT infrastructure to the cloud with help of orchestration. And one of the example we have seen with uh, UCS director and we have seen that what are the use case and what we can do with help of UCS director. So in summary, we can do the consolidation. In summary, we can do the virtualization. We can achieve the target of standardization and we can perform the automation. So all these things we can do with a orchestrator. Okay. Now the next topic is application programming interface. Now it is coming. Uh, how we can configure a device. So device configuration we can do with help of CLI. The, whatever Cisco IOS like Cisco routers and switches we use to do the configuration with help of CLI. There is no problem on that. Even most of the virtual device or virtual device manager we can do the configuration with help of CLI. Okay. Then we have SDK software development kit that is a collection of tools including code, uh, documents, examples. Means it's a complete package. SDK is something like it's a kit, it's a complete package and uh, we know about this that okay Java, Java programming language they are coming with say, uh, say SDK. Now we have Python as well because Python is one of the language mostly used uh, within the network infrastructure. It's lightweight type of language. It's a interpreter type of language means you can run it anywhere to any platform. It's something like that means uh, it's very lightweight and we don't need much, uh, you know, much database or much libraries or binaries to run the Python. Simply uh, we can execute this uh, Python program, so most of the Cisco devices they are supporting this Python programming. Okay, so that's why the use case for the Python is really very high. Then finally we have application programming interface. Again application programming interface is a set of function variables, data structure that uh, we can execute uh, over a manager 
uh, with help of that manager we can write those apis inside that particular fabric so what does it mean i have one use case here i'll show you in this particular session what does it mean by api and when we are integrating with rest full api or rest api what does it mean by rest api rest api full form you can see that rep uh, representational state transfer and then uh, and when we add with api what does it will do so i have an example case here say i'm going to show you this example case with help of we manage network management system so what is this we manage network manage uh, management system example i have taken from cisco sd wan called viptela and if you know about little bit about sd wan sd wan is nothing or sdn is nothing but the decoupling of the control and data plane even you can decouple with the management and or orchestrator plane as well but in loose term it's a decouple of the control and data plane so your control plane will be hosted somewhere and your data plane will be hosted somewhere data plane responsibility is just to forward the data traffic and control plane from where you can set the policies routing securities all sort of parameters okay now to set uh, now to send the instruction from the control plane to data plane you can you can do various things so either you can use cli there is no restriction or you can use say api say in this example suppose i am using rest full api so you can see here that i have this option of doing rest full api either i can use we manage that is one sort of uh, management uh what you can say the software inside uh, sd wan viptela yeah it's a software so here you have we manage say this is we smart this is we edge these are the terms inside sd wan cisco sd wan anyway uh, we will not go inside what these terms do but we are just checking that uh, i have one control plane and bottom i have data plane and this data plane i can send instruction with help of control plane that is the overall goal here and practically we can use api with help of api calls we can do all sorts of stuff so what what type of stuffs we can do here we can do certificate management we can do configuration we can uh, we can have device and device in, uh, inventory we can do monitoring real type monitoring double shooting means all sort of stuffs we can do with help of restful api and how we can do that obviously we have this rest apis and they have some methods they have some procedures so what procedures they have so inside http or https they can use get put post delete get means to retrieve or read information put means update an object post means create an object delete means remove an object okay so these are the functions inside the http or https method with help of those we can achieve the target okay and for uh, practical either we can check uh, cisco sd wan viptela that is one example the other example is say aci infrastructure where we have epic controller so with help of say restful api we can uh, we can configure epic controller and from that epic management plane we can configure rest of leaf and spy inside the uh, lan infrastructure final topic in this particular section is the open stack and open stack was basically developed by nasa and the rack space you can see here in the 2010 and why they developed that because they wanted a open type of source or open software to build public and private scalable cloud so that that was the reason to develop open stack okay now what is the good thing about open stack is that it is open so uh, open source software so anyone can contribute on this that is the good thing about open stack the other thing here you can see that this open stack it can be managed via web based dashboard or via open stack api okay uh, 
And finally, the third point is the OpenStack implementation consists of deployment of multiple services which are developed in individual development project. Okay, so that is the same thing that I told you that the companies they can develop their own way of or their own form of OpenStack, and it is uh, it is a type of a scalable, say, public and private uh, cloud. Okay. So we have some terms related to OpenStack. Now when we have a study about AWS, at that time I told you that whatever cloud you study, no worries, on all those clouds you will find services related to network, storage, compute, database, security, other stuffs. But these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 services will be major. And in all the cloud, you have these five services at least. Okay. So here you can see the keystone provide identity service. Identity service is something that will fall under security. Nova that will provide the compute. Okay. Glance. This coordinates the image that will be used to boot virtual and physical devices. Then we have Neuron that is actually very popular. Neuron controls networking resources to support cloud. So see Neuron networking. Then we have Swift offer data storage. Now this is belonging to the storage. Then we have Cinder. This is also belongs to storage. Then we have Heat that is used to manage entire or, uh, orchestration of infrastructure and application. So this is something uh, related to orchestration. Then we have Tube provides a scalable and reliable database. So you can see here uh, that everything will fall under these criteria say network, security, compute, storage, say management, database, even monitoring. So all these applications one by one if you compare you'll find uh, these acronyms that is used here or these services that is used here inside the OpenStack. Then we have Sahara that is implement, uh, implements data sensitive application. Then we have Zakhar offers multi-tenant cloud messaging. Uh, Barbican designed for secure storage. Uh, Designate provide DNS. In AWS we have something called root 53 which is providing the DNS. Here we have this Designate. Then we have a Manila build shared file system, Magnum, orchest orchestrate Linux containers. So we have service related to containers at will. Then Congress offer governance and compliance services. Finally, we have Mistral create and schedule the workflow. So if you learn the entire cloud paradigm or entire cloud infrastructure, different type of vendors, say OpenStack or uh, Amazon or say Cisco or some other vendors, they are doing the same thing but to achieve that same target they have their own services so maybe uh, the use of this particular designate inside openstack will be exactly same that that will be the use of say root 53 in amazon so likewise you can compare the various services across various service providers okay so let us close here now we reach to chapter number five and this is actually a very important chapter. We will learn about server virtualization. So what is server, what is operating system, what is a hypervisor, what is server virtualization, hypervisor architecture, different type of operating systems and how they are doing their virtualization. All these things we will learn in this particular chapter. So let us start with a definition that what is a server. Here you can see in the diagram that server is a special type of hardware plus software uh, which is used to serve application. Say for example, I have 10 clients. Now all these 10 clients, they can query, they can request, they can have certain application that will be served via a server. So suppose I have these 10 clients, at the moment suppose all these 10 clients are sending query for certain application to a server and server is replying to all these clients 
Okay, so what will be the necessary thing here? The necessary thing here is that the server components. And here you can see when we are talking about server components, that means we should have a good standard CPU, memory, RAM, and whatever server infrastructure we have, it should have good standard capabilities. Okay, so those are the main components of hardware uh, inside a server. You need good uh, say hardware plus you need a good uh, piece of software as well. So what type of software a server is running that is known as operating system. You can see here the definition of operating system. It can be defined as a software that control computer resources and provide common services for other computer program that run on the top of that. Means operating system you can think operating system as a heart of all the programs inside the uh, operating system itself or inside the server itself so this is my server and operating system is a program so in this server you may have so many other other uh, sub programs or sub routines but operating system is someone who is managing all these programs say maybe you have uh, NIC management programming, maybe you have some application management programming, maybe you have uh, say RAM management programming, say some other hardware management programming. So whatever thing that whatever applications that is running there inside a server that is managed and programmed or initiated via operating system and here you can see the list of the operating system say Microsoft, Linux, FreeBSD, Apple, Android, Cisco so these are the operating system few of these operating systems are working in a particular computer PC few of them are very popular inside the mobile device and Cisco operating system is actually there for Cisco networking devices like Cisco routers and switches and finally you can see here this Chrome operating system basically it is there to use web sometimes it is known as web based operating system if you are using that Chrome and even in the special type of Chrome book uh, you will find Chrome operating system okay now finally uh, this is the top level view of the operating system I already told you that operating system is someone who is managing all the programs. Operating system is a manager for all the programs inside your server and you may have programs related to disk management, NIC management, RAM management, CPU management. All these things, first of all, uh, they are interacting with operating system. Now, if we divide the operating system program, you can have low level program like uh, kernel programming and then you have high level program high level program you can think of this as a say human understandable form means human can understand a program low level program this is there for machine level programming some binary some uh, coding zero one program means those type of thing will be there okay so this is something like machine level programming this is again like human readable programming and that will be divided in inside the operating system because finally the end goal is that that your servers that is running operating system operating system who is carrying various type of programming and management of programming the final end goal is to serve the client request and how they are serving the client request suppose if there are n number of cloud clients then how do uh, they are doing the round robin inside their own operating system or in, inside their own resources okay so let let us stop here let us discuss about server virtualization history. Here you can see in the diagram that in 1970 IBM came with their mainframe. We'll see in the upcoming slide what is the architecture of the mainframe. After that in 1990s there was evolution of microprocessor or processing systems. At that time again there was evolution of this uh, computers and uh, personal computer systems and that was really huge and then 2000 uh, in that year VMware came with their virtualization concept and you know actual virtualization start from 2000 
although it was started by IBM in 1970 but the actual uh, things are actual production uh, is coming or it gained the popularity in 2000 so let me show you first what was the IBM mainframe infrastructure here you can see that this is the IBM mainframe infrastructure where we have the common hardware in the bottom then we have something called control program and then after on the top of control program you can see that CMS app CMS app CMS app for n number of user this CMS is nothing but conversational management system so what is happening with help of this uh, CMS that uh, CMS is communicating with control program and it is providing a dedicated hardware to a user so here you can see that a particular application that a user queried for with help of this CMS with help of this management system uh, it is communicating with a control program that is again uh, one, one, you can think that is an abstraction layer of the hardware so the hardware is abstracted inside CP that is the control program and finally with help of management system or the conversational management system the users they are getting individual application and that's true actually for the actual virtualization that came in 2000 so we'll discuss that as well in this particular session now what is the benefit of using this benefit is too much so what you are doing here that you have something called hardware and then on the top of hardware you have something called control program that you can think as a hypervisor will correlate with the existing infrastructure so on the top of hardware we have something called hypervisor and then on the top of hypervisors we have guest operating system and then the applications we have guest operating systems and then the application so here you have guest OS uh, in mainframe that is nothing but CMS conversational management system and then you have application correct so doing this what you are doing you are isolating the users but you have the common infrastructure or you are sharing your common uh, hardware okay now in 1990s uh, that uh, due to the evolution of these microprocessors we are getting the personal computer so 1990 it evolved like anything and so many companies they come with their own personal computers like Dell HP IBM they start building their personal computers and then in about 2000 we got a concept of virtualization means virtualization was in the full fledged here you can see that you have something called hardware on the top of hardware we have something called virtualization layer and what does it mean by virtual, uh, virtualization layer I will show you but the concept is same that you have hardware that is uh, common so this hardware is common for all and then you have something called hypervisor that is your virtualization layer on the top of that you have different different operating system and different different applications so let me show you in a diagram I have a diagram for you here you can see now we have hypervisor type 1 and type 2 so what does it mean by type 1 and type 2 uh, first of all this is the personal computer so in 1990s the evolution of personal computer simply you have hardware you have operating system you are running your applications that that's it means for one application I am using one operating system I am using one hardware but in hypervisor system what you can do that on the top of hardware you can have your hypervisor on the top of hypervisor you can have guest operating system and on the top of this operating systems we have applications now these operating systems may be uh, maybe as a uh, Microsoft based or Linux based or a unique a Unix based anything doesn't matter so as long as you have hypervisor the hypervisor will provide you dedicated hardware for all these operating system and on the top of that you can run the applications
You can see type 2 as well, that is not that much popular, but is still uh, we are using type 2 as well. So we have the hardware on the top of that, suppose I am running uh, Windows 10. On Windows 10, again I am installing hypervisor and then I am using some Linux or some other operating system and then I have application. So here you can see that uh, not only I am running the application on the top of operating system but on the top of our operating system I am running the hypervisor as well and on the top of hypervisors we have operating system in the app but this is not a feasible design because once you run the operating system after that if you run the hypervisor it will consume the uh, resources drastically but this is one of the scalable feature and most of the places you will find such type of uh, abstraction or su uh, such type of type 1 hypervisor is in use because it is highly scalable you can install a good amount of operating system on the top of these hypervisors okay so I hope you understand uh, this server virtualization will stop here in this section I am going to cover about a virtual machines and hypervisor so let us start you can see here we have main three class of uh, hypervisor actually we have so many hypervisors but most popular we have three one is the VMware ESXi one is the Microsoft Hyper, Hyper-V and one is the Linux KVM but we have other hypervisors as well we'll uh, discuss about them as well uh, what I want to show here that you can see that VMware they launched their product in two, 2001 and after say approximately 7 years or 6 years the other companies they have launched their hypervisor so that's why the VMware is one of the trending or the leading company in the hypervisor world or in the virtualization world apart from that we have hypervisors say, from the Red Hat from the Citrix uh, again from Oracle also we have hypervisor one of the popular say type 2 hypervisor is Oracle VM virtual box apart from that from VMware also we have type 2 hypervisor like VMware workstation VMware player and then, uh, then finally you can see the hypervisor from the Mac as well so these are the examples of hypervisor but most important or you can say the most popular one is the VMware ESXi now once you install the virtual machine inside or on the top of hypervisor at that time these virtual machine also need some resources so what type of resources these machines needed they need CPU, RAM, hard disk, controller say VNIC, uh, say other video controller, other peripherals same that uh, required for the physical the only difference here that they need a virtual CPU, virtual RAM, virtual hard disk etc. So once you install that particular machine inside your ESXi and if you are managing that ESXi say with uh, vSphere client you will find the detail of that VM like this so you can see here uh, they have the memory, CPU, card and the other accessories related to hardware now what is the definition of these disks so virtual disk here we can see that virtual disk is used as an internal storage then we have swap memory that is the replacement for the virtual memory log where you have all the files related to troubleshooting process we have configuration that extension is dot vmx so, uh, you can check the extension as well dot vmdk dot vm swap dot log dot vmx so we have configuration uh, which has all the files including virtual ram ne uh, nick information reference to other files and then finally we have the non volatile ram the extension in dot nvram that will be used during the vm initialization such as uh, boot process or the cpu setting okay let me clean these stuffs. Let us move to the next slide. And here you can see the folder. So suppose VMWeb1, and you can mark all these uh, extensions that we have discussed, like VMDK. Then we have this swap log. So lots of log. Then we have NVRAM extension, VMX extension. Uh, VMST extension so all these extensions we have and V stand for virtual and then you can correlate with the other uh, terminologies now next we have the hypervisor architecture as I already told you one of the popular one is the mic uh, is sorry is the VMware ESXi 
and here in this example we have all the three ESXi first of all let me explain with one of the ESXi so here this ESXi so this particular machine is termed as a host so this is a host number one on the top of host number one I have ESXi and on the top of that I have OS and application so likewise if you have a cluster of ESXi or say cluster of host then those cluster you can manage with help of say vCenter again this vCenter software can be managed with help of uh, with the help of vSphere client or web client so we have both the options either we can manage via tool or we can manage via web client as well means we have web app as well so here in the diagram you can see that directly I can manage all the ESXi uh, with respect to vSphere client that uh, in the previous uh, slide we have seen that display was with respect to vSphere client or if you want to manage you can call all these things inside vCenter and again with the help of vSphere client so you can see the vSphere client is common here with the help of vSphere client we can manage this next we have Hyper-V although this Microsoft Hyper-V uh, that was launched in near about 2007 or 8 uh, it seems like it's type 2 hypervisor but actually it is not this is also an example of type 1 hypervisor what you have to do say inside Windows Server 2012 you have to go and you have to enable the feature of Hyper-V once you enable the feature then you can use this particular product as a hypervisor and you can install number of operating system say once you install the operating system the logistic is again the same so you can see here that you have the host machine on the top of that we have Windows Server inside that I am enabling the hypervisor and then again I am installing the uh, operating system and the application now all these hosts can be managed via SCVMM that is System Center Virtual Machine Manager you can refer only machine manager or virtual machine manager so we can manage with help of say SCV MM or we can uh, take a console and we can manage via VMM administrator so VMM administrator they can log to SCV MM uh, SCV MM and they can manage the ESXi or all the operating system or we have other option that directly we can uh, manage via help of Hyper-V manager so either Hyper-V manager or SCV MM we can manage all the ESXi uh, op guest operating system and the applications let us move to the next section where we have other hypervisor that is Linux based virtual machine Linux based virtual machine you can see here the notes that standing on the uh, soldiers of giant called open source developer actually we need some open source technology so everyone can contribute and they can have a common platform uh, to for the organization or for the group of independent uh, organizations so you can see here that uh, it was launched as a type 1 and released in 2007 and because suppose if it is a open sh open source then you can also contribute on that correct now what is the logistic here this portion you'll find the same in all the hypervisors so again you have the hardware then you have the hypervisors on the top of that you have OS and app now how you are managing that here we can manage with help of say CLI GUI and we have other options as well we have Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization RHEV or we have OpenStack Nova and many other things that uh, from where we can manage such type of uh, hypervisor host and the guest and the application finally let us uh, discuss about the multi hypervisor environment and here you can see that the overall goal of this hypervisors technology is whatever hardware you have you can abstract that and you can share with uh, instances of independent virtual machines here also so okay we have say server virtualization and network virtualization network virtualization one example is say VLAN so uh, you can segment the big broadcast domain into a small small broadcast domain now in the network virtualization also we have so many new things like a, uh, okay for example say I'll, I'll tell you one example say ACI fabric so ACI fabric 
Now, ACI fabric is nothing but the leaf and spine cluster. Leaf is spine, and then we have one controller called EPIC. So, for example, so leaf is spine, leaf is spine, uh, leaf is spine, this type of structure we have. This EPIC is again connected with leaf, not spine. Okay, so we have leaf is spine, leaf is spine, this type of structure, and you are managing your uh, from your epic you are managing your leaf spine on all those things now here if you see this technology you will find that not only we have the concept of say server virtualization server virtualization means what we are sharing the memory say network input output cpu storage input output and then we are divided into the virtual machines so independent machine they 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 will get the shared resource now the network virtualization is what say suppose we are creating uh, say we are not sharing the cpu ram but we can share the functions so no virtualization of hardware encapsulation of traffic existing on infrastructure but actually this is not true now inside a network we can have both so suppose if we are creating vdc virtual device context at that time what we are doing inside the nexus box we can share those hardware ram cpu all those things okay so uh, this definition okay this is for definition but still inside network virtualization we can have the both features Let's move to the final slide of this particular section and here you can see the uh, increasing number of customer deploying multi hypervisor environment for various reasons so this concept uh, is that when you are using multi hypervisor means within a organization you are not using say only uh, VMware ESXi but you are using say Hyper-V as well then you are using say KVM as well so if a company uses multi hypervisor infrastructure so at that time what they can achieve they can decrease the license cost they can avoid vendor monopoly something like oh uh, the vendor can think oh he is using only my product so okay I will give this license in this price I will do this I will blah blah you know all these things okay so not uh, please do not depend only on one particular hypervisor or vendor you can have mix of vendors so you can uh, so you do not have vendor lock then uh, in third to leverage personal uh, specialized familiarity with a specific operating system that is also a good th uh, a nice thing to deploy new projects such as cloud computing or virtual desktop so suppose if you are not depending on a single uh, vendor for your hypervisor then you can explore more so whatever features are with that particular say vendor uh, with respect to less cost you can use those those features because generally what happens that one vendor with some products they have good features the other vendor with some products they have good features so like you know like that mix of the uh, vendor or mix of the product you can use in your production okay next topic in this section we have server virtualization feature you can see here we have lot many features inside uh, when we are doing the server virtualization features such as virtual machine high availability virtual machine live migration load balancing and other fault tolerance methods so let me explain all these methods one by one first of all let us discuss about virtual machine high ability what does it mean by high ability here you can see in the diagram we have virtual machines uh, hosted over say host 1 2 and 3 so here I have my guest operating system like this suppose if this particular host will go down then what will happen that my VM manager it will allocate one VM here one VM here and in this way they will provide high availability okay so high availability in terms of that suppose if your host is down your VMs will automatically migrate it to the other host okay let us discuss the feature number two that is the live migration now live migration is something that is used quite often inside the data center what does it mean it does mean that say your ESXi your host machine your host machines they have their common say LAN or SAN means they have their common data store 
Now suppose if you want to migrate one VM from one place to other place, what you can do, simply you can select, drag and drop. So you can drag from this host one, so this VM machine, you can just copy from here and you can put here. It's very easy actually. Uh, let me show you here, I have one slide for that. So here you can see that I can click here to migrate and then I have to select where I want to migrate. Okay, so it's very easy to migrate the uh, machines over host. Third feature you can see here, the load balancing. Now in this particular diagram you can see that host number three is using only 25% of the resources and host number one is something like 95% utilized. So what you can do, you can migrate one of the VM from host 1 to 3 and then all these machines they are using 60% of resources. So this is something load balancing, this is also very easy. Now we have this fault tolerance method, what we can do in the fault tolerance. In this case a particular VM, so this VM is actually mapped with both of the host and this is something uh, that is cost effective and you are not doing actually for all the virtual machines. So suppose in your organization some of the applications are very critical. So for those VMs who is hosting those applications, you can apply this strategy. So if anything happen with this particular uh, say host machine, your traffic will not fall, your traffic will not drop automatically uh, it, it is associated with say other host. You can think this as a say active standby type of mechanism where if one will go down automatically the standby will become active and then the traffic will flow from this host to this host machine through uh, these applications. Okay, so these are the major features inside the VM or inside you can say the uh, uh, this is this example is actually for VMware ESXi, so you can specify the vendor name. Okay, uh, this this particular features are with respect to say VMware uh, hypervisors or VMware host. Uh, I haven't tested all these features in other vendors uh, like Microsoft or KVM, but I have tested inside uh, VMware, and all these features are working inside VMware. Uh, I hope these features. Uh, straight through with other vendors as well. Okay, so let us discuss some other features as well. We have some more features, something like power management. Again, this power management feature is something, say, suppose if some of the VMs they are not utilizing the power, then that particular power will be allocated to some other VM. So automatically it is doing some power management. If someone is not using the power, then uh, that particular power you can assign to some other uh, VMs. Then we have this maintenance mode, suppose if you want to upgrade the host, so at that time you can put that particular host in the, uh, into the maintenance mode and then you can upgrade that host. We have snapshot, this is again one of the neat feature, you can say that uh, most usable feature inside VM the snapshots. Now once you take the snapshot, what is happening that that particular VM, they retain the state and data of uh, the machine. Okay, so say you can take a snapshot, say you have instance A, you have you have done some work, then you have taken the snapshot B, instance B is something like you are doing some work and you are saving. You are doing some work, you are saving. So again, you, you need not go from zero from where you have started rather than you have snapshot A, B, C, D like that and from there once you start the snapshot say at the point D it will start from D. It will not start from A or B. Okay. Let us discuss some other features as well. So we have some other features uh, say cloning and template. Simply we can clone a particular VM so we can create a copy of that particular VM and suppose if you want or if you have use case that you need to clone time to time, better you create the template and that template can be associated with various virtual machines. So this is something like you are doing the reusability of the code. So whenever you are doing the cloning or the template, 
that means that you are reusing that features or you are re uh, you are re you are making that thing reusable okay so same thing you don't need to create from 0 to 10 what you are doing that already that thing is there just because you have template or you have the clone you can map certain vm with those particular template or you can clone means again the copy of the state okay so these are the features we have inside vm machine and i have tested all these features with respect to vmware hypervisors and i hope that this is true with the other yeah, other hypervisors as well okay so let us close here this is the last recording in this particular section cloud computing server virtualization and we'll learn about containers as well now we know about this particular cloud computing architecture that in this cloud computing uh, they have taken concept from VMware as well so as on demand self service as on demand so we have something called service catalog here if a user if has uh, if end user has some requ uh, requirement it will raise one request inside this portal inside this portal it will contact with the orchestrator that is say our UCS director now that UCS director because you have seen that inside UCS director we have uh, converge hyperflex physical virtual so many things we have inside there so from UCS director I can query for some resources and then here you can see in the bottom with help of this metering metering will get the notification and finally this user will get the resource is something like we are doing something on demand when you need it you provision it when you don't need it remove it something like that okay so in VMware also we have such type of features say suppose if you want some VMs to run you can run that VM simply you can go to the VM manager you can click VM power on it will be power on if you don't want you can make that VM as a say you either you can power off that VM there is no problem once you power off again those resources will be shared resources in terms of not the uh, say the CPU RAM is still CPU RAM memory whatever you have allocated at the time of booting that system it will be there but those resources will be released and that will be uh, there for the other VMs as well if they require okay so that is the overall concept of VMware as well and uh, that is taken inside the cloud computing and uh, here you can see the other option as well so other feature inside the cloud computing is what the other feature is you can see here the resource pooling is the other feature resource pooling means what that you have common CPU RAM NIC disk storage everything and then uh, you have say client A client B client C so all these clients for uh, for different different clients you don't have dedicated hardware correct likewise in VMware also you have a common hardware okay on the top of that you have hypervisors and then you have guest operating systems for different different applications so if you correlate this VM resource pooling with the cloud resource pooling you will find there are similarities okay so these are the things that that is common in the server virtualization and the cloud computing like on-demand self-service or uh, this resource pooling okay so let us move ahead and discuss about uh, what is mean by Linux containers or so what is containers now we know this concept of virtualization that is basically the server virtualization but sometimes you don't need the complete virtualization you don't need emulated hardware you you do not need a dedicated operating system but you want some instance of operating system and that's the concept of Linux container now containers are you can think that virtualization of operating system so we have two type of virtualization one is say server virtualization and other uh, other concept is the containers server virtualizations are some things that the virtualization of the physical hardware but this containers are actually the virtualization of actual operating system so what does it mean let me show you in the diagram then it will be easy to understand here you can see that in case of 
virtual machine or in case of server virtualization we have physical hardware on the top of that we have hypervisor then we have guest operating system and the applications now while doing this what we uh, what we are doing is still we are using so much resources okay because uh, to run this hypervisor you need very good hardware then only you can allocate those hardware to the different different operating system now suppose if you don't want to uh, run this hypervisor then what you can do say on the particular hardware you can run linux operating system and with help of container you can uh, virtualize these linux operating system okay so you can see that we have reduced one layer from here we have reduced other layer from here at least one layer has been reduced and that's why it's very fast so if we compare the virtual machine with respect to linux containers say in terms of programming in terms of some specific task these containers are way ahead than this virtual machines and that's why they are becoming very very popular at the moment suppose if you want to do the management of these containers then we have the docker so with help of docker uh, we can run or we can execute the commands with respect to say cli rest api docker files and we can uh, control all the containers inside the operating system okay so if you correlate this container you can correlate this container with say virtual machine manager or vmm so what is the functionality of vmm they are managing the different ESXi or they are managing the different host likewise with help of this docker you can manage different different containers we have some other theories as well let us discuss this and then we'll close hope at the moment you understand what is use case of the linux containers it's a virtualization of the operating system and we have some some sort of features here listed you can see the control group so what is control group they are providing resource isolation to each container dedicated cpu memory input output network accordingly that means they are very important they are providing the resources to the containers then we have access control they will check that who is authorized who is not not authorized then finally we have the name space this is truly the uh, sorry this is truly the programming concept name space so name space is a type of placeholder and what is use of uh, name space you can see that isolate the application perspective of the operating system offering distinct process tree network connectivity and user identifier for each provisioned container okay so this is actually purely networking thing a thing so we have three major component one component is allocating the resources one component is checking who is authorized who is not authorized and third component is there to provide the networking binary trees for different different program or routines running inside the elexi container okay so we are almost done with this particular section i hope you learn a lot in this particular section see you in the next section now we reach to chapter number 6 in this particular chapter i am going to cover about vmware about cisco 1000b and finally we will learn about vxlan means three major topic i am going to cover in this particular chapter so let us start with the virtual machine and networking now here you can see that when we are talking about vmware virtualization at that time we have three things so first of all you need a actual hardware whatever bare metal or server you have sometimes we are using ucs say c or uh, m series blade server so c series blade server or ucs chassis sometimes you may have ibm or hp servers upon which you can install the hypervisor so this particular hypervisor is something say esxi maybe 5.0 or 5.5 or 6.0 these versions and then on the top of that you can install the operating system and then you can install the applications okay now once we have this particular so say suppose i have two operating system over this particular host so suppose for the sake of simplicity this is host on this particular host 
I have two operating system. Now these operating systems, suppose if these operating systems has to communicate, how they will communicate? Okay. So for that, whenever we have this situation over each individual host or ESXi, we have something called V switch. Okay. So by default, we have some virtual switch. With help of that virtual switch, our east to two ways traffic will flow. Okay. Now we have some challenges here while we are dealing with the VMware. What are the, those challenges? So how, who will uh, examine or who will direct the traffic from east to west? That I already told you, the answer is V switch. Now again, if your traffic is going from south to north, then who will monitor or track that traffic? Again, the answer is V switch. So the V switch, that is the definition of V switch, VMware V switch. Today I'll log into say vSphere 5.0. I'll show you about that uh, client and the operation. So while we are take, uh, talking about the V switch, now it's the V switch responsibility who will do the communication inside the host uh, with these guest operating system plus the frame will go from inside to the outside uh, outside world. So obviously you have something called virtual NIC and you have something called physical NIC. So both type of NICs you have. Okay. So that is the responsibility of vSwitch. I'll show you. Uh, let, let me log in to the uh, ESXi. Let me show you that how these things are look like inside vSphere client and uh, here you can so see that inside inventory if I go inside inventory and then host and cluster then you can see here that I have two host ESXi1 ESXi2 and uh, let me show you that how these virtual machines so these are the virtual machines like uh, F5 big IP or uh, base VM these are the virtual machines so suppose if we are talking about Base, uh, base VM at that time it is mapped with ESXi2 means it is mapped with the other ESXi if I am clicking here to say F5 big IP here you can see it is mapped with ESX, ESXi1 so one of the VM is mapped with ESXi2 one of them are mapped with ESXi1 so suppose if I do the right click even we have this option drag and drop so where it is mapped ESXi2 what I can do here, simply I will drag and drop this to ESXi1. It will ask question that, do you want to migrate virtual machine? My answer is yes, I want to do that because the validation is successful. Now you can see this V motion. We have discussed about this V motion in the earlier uh, sections that we, when we have discussed about the uh, features of this particular virtualization or the ESXi or the hypervisors. Now it is going to be mapped to e, uh, ESXi1 that is the host 1. vMotion priority is the high priority. Yes, I want to finish. And in the bottom you can see the status bar that migration of the virtual machine. So this is something like uh, we are doing the migration from one host to the other host. Now if I check this VM now you can see this is EXI1. So now this F5 is also inside ESXi1. This base BM is also inside ESXi1. Uh, in the previous section we have discussed about various features as well. So here you can see that we have features related to snapshot that we can take a snapshot, we can save the state of a particular VM machine, then we can migrate we can create clone, we can have a template feature, we can have fault tolerant feature, I can turn on it, then we have some performance feature as well. So suppose if I want to migrate, change host, you want to change host, yes, now you have to select from where to where, so already it is in ESXi1, I want to send to say ESXi2, validation successful, vMotion will happen, yes, so now you can see that uh, this is 40, 42 percent. Now the migration is in progress and you can see here that how easy is to move the virtual machines over one place to other place. Either we are doing the migration or we are doing the vMotion. It's very easy. Simply you have to click. Now you can see 
it is moved to ESXi2. Okay? Now, why I open this particular section? Because I want to show you about the networking task. So, if I go inside networking, here you can see that we have some port groups. We'll discuss about that port groups. This is actually the distributed virtual switch DBS. Again, we'll discuss about this in the upcoming slides. Okay, and uh, we'll check these things. So, I am here in the uh, my v, my v center DB uplink. So, what is happening here? And again, uh, I'm going to cover it one more time. So, suppose this is my virtual machine. It should have one link that is going to be connected with the northbound traffic. That should be your physical link. So that's why you have this physical link. And then one, you have actually here we have concept of port groups. Now the VM, that is virtual NICs, they are mapped with the port group. We'll learn about that. Let me stop here. Let me go back to the uh, slides and then I'll come back here. Now, first of all, let us understand about the port groups and then we'll move further. So, what is the port group? Say, definition of vSwitch connectivity policy which essentially defines how the virtual devices handle traffic that belong to a group of VM. So, suppose if we have group of VMs, okay, and if you are applying some policies to group of VMs, that those policies are termed as a port group. Now, what are the policies we have with the port group? You can see here you have policies related to security, like promiscuous MAC changes and uh, transmits, forced uh, transmits. Then you have uh, with the traffic shaping. It's not very clear here in this particular diagram, but yeah, in the port group you have uh, what you can say the policies. So your port group is nothing but what? It's a policy, correct? And where you are applying these policies? You are applying these policies to the VMs. But where in the VM? Where in the virtual machine? Actually, over the VNIC. Okay? So let me show you that how you can apply these port group policies. Port group is nothing but the policies to the VNIC and then I'll come back to this. So here I am. What I'll do, let me show you that the port group policies. Let us go to the networking. I'm already inside networking. Let us go to VM, host and cluster. Say so if you are here, if you do right click, edit setting, say for F5 big IP, here you can see the network adapters, correct? Now these network adapters, you can see here, I can connect them or I can attach with service network, VM network. So let me add this with the VM network. Let me add this with the VM network. Okay. Then, so this is one of the VM. Then what I will do? I will go to say base VM. Go to edit setting. Here also it has adapter. It is already connected with the VM network. So you can see here that the base VM and the big five IP, they are connected with the same port group or the same policy. Then what is this VM network? This is a standard port group. If I click here, this is VM network is a standard port group. And uh, where is this port group? You want to see that again, you can go to the networking and here you can see the VM network. Okay, so what is the standard base which even you have the definitions as well. So this particular port group I have assigned with the F5 as well as I will as I have assigned with the base VM. These are the port groups. These are nothing but the policies and we can assign this policy to the group of VM. Okay, I hope you understand these things. Otherwise you can just uh, go back, check uh, what I have explained earlier and again you can start from here. Let me go back to the slide. Again, uh, this is the same explanation that already I have given to you. Here we have these policies, security, traffic surfing and other things that you can check. Then we have uh, how we can assign that. So already I told you that how we can go and assign that. There is no much burden on that. So we are very much done with this particular section and 
uh, I try to explain all these things. Uh, if you want, you can just redo this recording. Just try to learn up to this point because it's very important to understand that what is uh, uh, vSwitch or virtual switch because with all the ESXi we have one virtual switch. Why we have one virtual switch? Because inside that ESXi, on the top of that ESXi, all those VMs they want to communicate. And what is port group? Port group is nothing but the policies with the common VM adapters. Okay. Next we have distributed virtual switch. In short, DVS. Now why we need distributed virtual switch? We need distributed virtual switch because due to the limitation of the port group. Now we are study about port group. Port groups are nothing but what? Policy. And those policies we can apply to a group of VM. Correct? Now what is happening here that suppose I have host, say ESXi host 1. Suppose I have ESXi host 2. Suppose I have ESXi host 3. So for example, I have 3 ESXi host. Now all these ESXi host, they have a vSwitch. So I have vSwitch here. I have vSwitch here. And then I have vSwitch here. So individual vSwitch for all these host machines. Correct? Now the problem here, that suppose if you have port group here, you apply it to the uh, physical interfaces or maybe the virtual interfaces or what you can say the NIC. So suppose you have applied those policies or port group with the NIC card. Now the problem is that these port groups now they can't scale because these are the individual switches. Again, for this particular uh, ESXi you have to write again port groups means you have to create port group here also you have to create a uh, port group so all the places you have to create the port group means port groups are not scalable port groups means the policy applied to VMs are not scalable that's why you need one central type of switch so you need a big giant switch who can be clubbed with all of the switches and once you apply a policy here or the port group policies here then it will be applicable for all the host and for all the host means for all the VMs or the group of VMs. Okay? So that was the reason we are looking for the distributed virtual switch. Let me show you here in the diagram. I have one diagram and VMware they have started their uh, distributed virtual switch with uh, VMware vSphere version 4.0 we have Cisco version as well that that also we'll discuss so here you can see that I have host machine 1 and I have host machine 2 in these host machines in host machine 1 I have only one VM in host machine 2 you can see I have three VM now this particular distributed virtual switch it is attached with the host 1 plus host 2 as well but although they have the V switch these V switches these V switches are there no problem on that. So these V switches are there, but they can't be extended switch. So if you need extended switch across different host where you can apply the global port group policies or you can apply the port groups, then you need DBS. Okay. Later we'll discuss about what is Cisco take on that, but let us discuss about what all these acronyms means means what is vnic what is vmnic what is vm kernel so i have separate slide for that here you can see the definition of vnic let me go back you can see here uh, the uh, the adapter associated with the virtual machine is vnic that is the virtual nic the adapter that is attached with the host machine that is going outside means you can think this as uh, this as a physical adapter which is communicating with the actual switches or the traffic is going from south to north one that is your VM NIC virtual machine NIC and then for management uh, uh, purpose we have VM kernel NIC that is VMK NIC so you have the definitions here you can refer these definitions now good thing about this that either it is a VM NIC or VNIC you can see here that you can apply port groups here you can apply uplink port group to the VNIC uh, VM NIC, sorry, and you can apply the port group here to the VNIC as well. So not only the physical but the virtual uh, ports also, you can apply the port group. Finally, for the VM NIC also, you can use the uh, 
distributed port groups. Okay, means you are extending the limit of the switch inside the virtual domain, and for uh, east uh, and for you can say the south to north and east to west traffic, you have the capabilities inside the port groups and the Vnix. Cisco they they came with uh, their own version of distributed virtual switch in 2006, and because Cisco is famous for their Nexus. Switch, Cisco uses the same concept that we have with the actual Nexus switch. So we know that inside Nexus switch we have something called supervisor module and then you have line card. Uh, those are something called Ethernet module. Correct? So these virtual switches, uh, Cisco, what they have done in their distributed virtual switch, again they have something called a virtual supervisor module that is the VSM. So you have VSM1 and you have Virtual Supervisor Module 2 and then you have something called VEth. So you have something called VEM module, V Ethernet module. So in this particular Cisco 1000 V switch you will find VSM Supervisor Module and the Ethernet modules. In the upcoming sections we will learn more about this but here in the definition you can see that you have Supervisor Module you have Ethernet module, you have Ethernet interfaces, then you have virtual interfaces. Obviously, Ethernet interfaces will communicate with the uplink and this virtual Ethernet module, they will communicate from uh, east to west. So, this is for east to west traffic. This is this Ethernet module or Ethernet interface is for uh, south to north bound traffic. Okay, so let us stop here. Let us discuss more about 1000V. And we have already discussed this that uh, we have two abstractions. So these physical hardware or these Ethernet module you can think as a WIM module that is a virtual Ethernet module. And these supervisor engines say supervisor slot A and B. Here you can think as a uh, VSM module that is one is the active and one is the standby supervisor engine. Just like we have in the physical Nexus box we can think this uh, 1000V virtual uh, nexus as well. Same same type of thing we can analyze. Now we have discussed this as well that we have the Ethernet module, we have the supervisor module uh, which is working as a active and a standby. Okay, so these things we have discussed. Now suppose if you want to see this via command line, so if you type say show module, in that first two slots you'll find as a supervisor engine. You can see here one is active, one is HA standby and then you have number of line cards. Depends that how many WIM module you want. So you have the WIM modules. There, uh, here you can see what is the version running here on these supervisor engines and the and these line cards. So with help of show module like you are doing in the Nexus switches here also you can check. Finally, this comes very important concept about port profile. The port profile is nothing but a type of template or configuration template. Those interfaces can inherit. So you can create port, uh, port profile and the interfaces can inherit this pro, uh, port profile. Today I will show you that how you can configure via CLI. Here you can see this example that I can go inside conf -t like any Cisco do, uh, devices we are doing that. Then I am creating say VLAN. 11.13 then port profile type V Ethernet so we have option either we are creating port profile for VMs or we are creating port profiles for Ethernet so we have uh, two types here one is V Ethernet say uh, VMPP this is the name then switch port mode access these things we have done in the switches as well finally you can see here that I am assigning this VMware port group once you type this command and once you enable this like a state enable then if you go and see your VMware vSphere or vCenter then you will find these pro uh, port profiles inside that GUI as well so first of all this is the virtual Ethernet likewise you can create the physical Ethernet as well like port profile type Ethernet then uplink this is the name 
then uh, more this trunk allowed VLAN 1113 and finally it is VMware port uh, group and state enable now if you want to check this here you can see your uplink port profile and here you can see your VM port profile so you have these port profiles one is with respect to VM one is with respect to uplink or the physical VNIC so both things we have inside the VMware virtual uh, vCenter machine now we have some added advantages as well like once we are using Cisco Nexus 1000B then the feature with respect to Nexus we are getting here as well features like CDP then we can create a VLAN inside VLAN that is the private VLAN we can uh, span the ports or we have the feature of ER span as well so remotely also we can monitor or we can send that uh, you can say simply the port mirroring you can do we have quality of service feature we have DHCP snooping IP source card dynamic RF inspection features as well and then again we have one other feature that is a trust sec related to security so these advanced features we have when we are using Cisco Nexus 1000B and not only here but in other hypervisors also they are supporting Nexus 1000B like VMware virtualization or say uh, KVM or OpenStack they are also supporting uh, Cisco this 1000B so let me go and do the configuration I will show you the configuration how we can configure the port profiles what you can do here you can see my CLI let me do the configuration here go to global configuration mode you can create VLANs I can exit now I want to create port profile here you can see say type I can use V Ethernet say VM port profile then switch port mode access say switch port access VLAN 11 no shut then VMware port group and finally the state enabled so once I have one a VM port profile next time I will create port profile type Ethernet so this time I will go and create a port profile type Ethernet and the name I can give say up link port profile then you can give switch port mode trunk because this time I want to allow say allowed VLANs are say 11 to 13 and then finally no shirt and then the VMware port group and then the state enable done okay so this way you can create the port profile here so I have created two profile one is virtual one is the Ethernet and then you can apply or attach the policies inside 1000 V. In the coming two to three videos we will learn about the VXLAN. Now the question is that what is VXLAN? VXLAN is nothing but virtual extensible local area network where we are extending L2 capabilities over L3 tunnel. Okay, so we'll learn about this that how we can extend it and for this this extension we are using UDP uh, headers and we'll see that the VXLAN encapsulation as well in the upcoming recordings. So suppose you have your physical infrastructure like this, say you have devices say in data center 1, 2, 3 or branch 1, 2, 3, suppose this is A, this is B this is C this is my underlay and suppose if I build overlay so here you can see that I can build VXLAN overlay uh, on the top of my underlay and then you can see here that I have something called VTEP VTEP is nothing but the VXLAN tunnel endpoints and then I can communicate from one VTEP to other VTEP Okay. Now there are so many new terms you can see here that uh, the VTEP, the VNI, VNID, all these stuffs. I will explain all these things one by one. Now if we use VXLAN, then what benefits I have? You can see 
that in the classical Ethernet, the VLAN capability or the uh, what you can say the number of VLANs that you can use is a 4K. It's a 2 to the power 12. That means this much. Now here the capability is enhanced drastically. Here we can use VXLAN 2 to the power 24. That means it's a huge number. Okay. So one thing that we we have uh, increased here that's the number of VLAN we can increase. Okay. That's the one thing. The second thing that it allows layer 2 multipathing uh, multi and that is very much similar to the fabric path. So in fabric path also we have uh, you can say what that we have layer 2 routing capabilities so uh, once we introduce routing inside MAC addresses that means uh, it will give the same feature that we have with the routing okay so that's why we have this layer 2 multipathing it is supporting cloth fabric so we may know that that we have fabric structure like leaf spine and then again leaf and then again spine logically all the gateways they are connected by one hop so from one leaf to other leaf I can go like this I can go like this it's it's uh, like a cloth fabric that you are always one hop away or your gateway is say one hop away like that includes a scaling enhancement yes correct so once we use this type of uh, strategy the scaling will increase now the other steps that we can see here that optimized control plane that is Mac learning app table bum that is the broadcast unicast multicast replications does not break layer 2 agency requirement okay so this is again one of the feature that it optimize the control plane then allows for any to any stateless layer 2 layer 3 transport uh, that is vmotion so we know in the next generation data center we are very much concerned about say uh, so not only the north-south traffic but we are very much concerned about the east-west traffic as well okay and in that uh, scenario we are using V motions as well so when uh, once we are doing the V motions say from one data center to other data center at that time the capability is stateless okay simply we can uh, drag and drop the V motions there is no problem on that then finally you can see that allows for multi tenancy that is again one of the uh, no, capability of this VXLAN separation of customer traffic over shared underlay fabric because we are using something called the overlay underlay concept so here we can logically divide the traffic we can create multi tenancy we can have the features of say VRF where we can segregate the customer traffic okay then finally you can see that allows for overlapping L2 and L3 addresses that is VLANs and IP addresses are locally significant okay so because we have the recap endpoints so locally I can reuse the IP addresses so not only the IP addresses but we can uh, allows for overlapping of L2 and L3 so MAC address and IP addresses we can reuse so these are the features we have uh, in my VXLAN you can see that there are lot many features not only we have the address space multipathing uh, enhancement in the control plane uh, reusability of layer 2 layer 3 but we can create the multi tenancy and we can segregate or separate the customer traffic as well okay so let us quickly discuss about the VXLAN terminology the first terminolo terminology we have is the VXLAN overlay what does it mean by overlay now here you can see in the definition that overlay or VXLAN segment is a layer 2 broadcast domain okay and that the identifier for this layer 2 broadcast domain is VNID that extend tunnels 
traffic from one VTAP to other uh, other VTAP. Now, simply if you want to understand this, that under the underlay we have the overlay infrastructure, and this overlay infrastructure, where to where we want to communicate. So we want to communicate from VTAP to VTAP, correct? And this VTAP to VTAP is nothing but the layer 2 extension and these VTAP to VTAP are nothing but tunnel endpoints. Okay. Now to identify these tunnel endpoints, we have something called say VNID. Okay. We'll see in the next recording that uh, what is the significance of VNID because VNID is something uh, which, will, which will provide you the identification of the VXLAN. You will see that in the upcoming section. The next we have the VTAP. Now the VTAP device that provide both encapsulation and decapsulation of classical Ethernet and VXLAN packets to and from the VXLAN segment. That's correct. So VLAN, they will provide encapsulation they will create tunnel, they will send to the other VTAP, from there they will do the decapsulation and vice versa. Now what type of interfaces are there? The switch port interface on local LAN, layer 3 interfaces, SVI interfaces. Correct? Then we have VXLAN gateway, obviously a VTAP that bridge traffic between VXLAN segments. So whenever you are bridging the traffic you need gateway okay? and you can define the VXLAN gateway. Now finally VNID, uh, we'll discuss more about this VNID in the upcoming sections. Here also you can see that it's a tag, okay, given to every VLAN which need to get extended over VXLAN. Every VLAN between the DCI which is extending will be mapped with a valid VNID tag. So suppose if we don't have this VNID tagged map or this tag value mapped, then we can't extend the VLAN from one DC to other DC, one data center to other data center. This is manually defined on all the VTAP participating in the VXLAN. So that means that this is a configuration and it should be manually defined from all VTAP to all VTAP or from all data center to all data center to extend the VLAN. Okay, so this is the tag value. VNID is nothing but the tag value. Okay, and it is used to extend the VLAN from one data center to other data center. Then finally we have NVE, Network Virtualization Edge. It's a logical representation of VTAP. Uh, this is quite obvious. So whenever we are creating some logical interfaces, we can see this overlay. So we have underlay and on the top of this underlay we have overlay. So whenever we are talking about any type of overlay strategy, either it's uh, OTB or any. There are so many overlay strategies we have. Whenever we are defining any overlay strategy at that time we need some logical interface. In this case, in, in case of VXLAN, we have NVE, Network Virtualization uh, Interface and that is the logical representation of VTAP. Okay, and then finally we have the underlay. Underlay means our physical resources where we are running OSPF, EIC, RP, IS, IS, uh, etc. Okay, so these are the overview and uh, VXLAN introduction. In the next section, we will learn about the encapsulation of VXLAN. Okay. Let us learn about this VXLAN encapsulation. In VXLAN encapsulation, you can see here that it is adding 50 bytes of overhead. 8 bytes for VXLAN header, then 8 for UDP, then 20 for outer IP header, then 14 say for outer MAC header. Okay, so let us discuss all these headers one by one. When we are talking about VXLAN header, uh, we have say 1 byte or 8 bits for VXLAN tag and you can see here in the diagram as well that RRRR represent uh, say reserve. So 
seven bits are reserved and one bit is one means it's it is set as one that means that VX line is on okay then we have three bytes reserved for future purpose again one byte is reserved for future purpose that also we can refer here in the diagram but we have three bytes that is the VNI that is the VX LAN identifier now this is a value which is mapped with the VLAN so here you can see in the Nexus 7K when we are defining a VLAN in terms of reach domain 10 at that time member VNI is 10101 is a number actually it can be uh, no, 3 byte that's the significance actually so when whenever we are talking about 3 byte that means we have 24 bits and this much number of VLANs that we can create that is 2 to the power 24 so this is the actual number okay and that number is coming from VNI in uh, Nexus 7K we can configure like this in Nexus 5K or 9K we can configure like VLAN 10 and then the VN segment 10101 like that okay so this is actually the significance of the VNI then we have the outer UDP header now again this is very uh, interesting here that for outer destination UDP the port number is fixed 4789 but for the outer source UDP port it is the hash value between port number say 49152265535 okay so this is actually very interesting this particular 8 bytes are derived from this calculation then we have outer IP header outer IP header is easy the outer source IP will be the L3 IP address of the VTIP okay which is doing the encapsulation for VXLAN so this outer source IP source IP is actually your IP address your VTIP that from which place you are doing the encapsulation now there is Cisco recommendation that uh, you can use the loopback addresses for that okay because obviously we know if the physical interface will go down then uh, everything will go down but if you are using loopback address uh, means it can associate with n number of physical uh, interfaces okay so this recommendation is not uh, with VXLAN this is for all the overlay technologies so for all the overlay technologies uh, you please do not associate your physical uh, interfaces think that you are making your overlay uh, over the box okay so for one box if there are n number of interfaces doesn't matter you create one loopback interface that will represent this box as a recap okay great now the outer destination IP address will be L3 so this this was the outer source now we have the outer destination uh, will be the L3 IP address of the destination we take in case of unicast traffic but it's a multicast IP address in case of bump traffic so this is again important you can make a note the unicast and multicast uh, association and again in in case of MAC addresses as well the outer source MAC address will be the MAC address of the source VTIP but the outer destination MAC will be the next hop L3 device MAC address in case of uh, say unicast traffic or multicast MAC address in case of bump traffic okay so the analogy for IP and the MAC is the same the so source is your IP, your MAC, but the destination is the multicast if you have bump traffic or the next shop, obviously next shop IP address if you have the unicast address. Okay. Again, we have some logical representation or the frame format here. You can see that this is the actual Ethernet that is getting encapsulated inside VXLAN the 50 bytes of header so I have 8 bytes of 
VXLAN, then 8 for uh, UDP, then 20 for IP, and then 14 for MAC. Okay? And here inside VXLAN, we have reserve values. We have reserve value. We have this one, uh, what you can say, say 8 bit or actually it's a 1 bytes, but it's okay. 8 bit out of those 8 bit, I have 1 bit set as a VXLAN identifier. And then the most important thing we have is the 24 bits actually so that will give you 2 to the power 24 uh, VLAN IT capabilities for the VXLAN header okay and then we have already discussed about the UDP and the uh, IP and the MAX so this is the overall frame format again uh, we'll see this here in the detail that uh, all the frame all the bits you will find here so let's quickly complete this. I have this VXLAN header. Inside this VXLAN header you can see that uh, one bit is reserve. Again the same thing that we are talking on and on. Then the 3 byte reserve. Then the VNID that is the 16 mini, a million possible segments. Then the reserve bit. This, no, this now we know. Then for outer UDP this is fixed 4789 but the source will be derived from the port numbers that we have mentioned earlier then we have outer IP address here also we can check what is the source IP and destination IP then we have outer MAC header here also we can check what is the source MAC and the destination MAC okay so this is the VXLAN encapsulation and the detail about this VXLAN encapsulation let me show you that how you can configure VXLAN over Nexus 1000B and here we can uh, see the steps first of all you have to enable the feature then you have to enable or you have to configure the bridge domain say VXLAN 5000 bridge domain VXLAN say 6000 with a segment ID and the multicast group finally inside the V Ethernet say 5000 and 6000 I will define all these port groups Okay, so these are the configurational steps I'm going to follow. Let me open my 1000V. First of all, you need to enable the feature called segment, and then you need to define the bridge domain. Say VXLAN 5000. Segment ID is say 5000. Then I can define a group 239.555. We are very much done. Next time I can define a bridge domain say VXLAN 6000. The segment ID is say 6000. The group I will use 239.6.6.6. So once we are done with this, after that I need to create port profile. Say port profile type uh, V Ethernet and I can give name say a VM. 5000 switch port mode access switch port access bridge domain so what bridge domain I have say VXLAN 5000 no shared then VMware port group and finally a state enable so the state is enable likewise I can create one other port profile say for VM 6000 correct ensuring that it is already existing so what I'll do I will delete that Okay, no problem. I'll create say 6001 just to show you uh, as for example. And then switch port mode access. Switch port access bridge domain say VX LAN 6000. 
no shirt then we can assign the vm group port group and then finally straight enable okay so this is the way that you can enable the vxlan inside chapter number 7 virtual network services and application container in this particular chapter we will learn about various network servicing devices those devices are say firewall advanced routers server load balancers and wan accelerator so one by one i will explain all these things so first of all uh, in this particular diagram you can see that how these network service devices come into the picture in first example we have something called vlan manipulation simple example that while vlan 100 traffic is going to say vlan 200 traffic at that time in between i have network service device now this network service device can be firewall can be load balancer can be web uh, web cache device it can be some other a VPN device, whatever means whatever network services they can provide, they can provide in line to the traffic between say 100 to uh, 200. Then in the next example, you can see that uh, this is one of the real example when the traffic is coming say from WAN to this server means user is somewhere behind the service provider. So at that time. Uh, this policy based router it is redirecting the traffic towards the network service device and then again it is going towards server in the third example you can see we have WCCP device here what it is doing it is doing some some sort of cache inside this device and then the request is going to set to now here you have the cache then it is internally redirected towards 3 Okay, so you have some pre-information about the flow of the traffic in, in in terms of cache, and then it is providing the servicing. We have some other examples as well, such as Cisco Virtual Security Gateway. We have already discussed about Cisco Prime Network Service Catalog and a use case of this. That with help of this particular catalog device, we can create security profiles. Con uh, configure of say virtual security gateways and we can establish the multi-tenancy hierarchy defined by say tenants uh, virtual data centers applications virtual applications like that so that is the use case of uh, Cisco Prime Network Service Catalog PNSC then we have this virtual security gateway will uh, study about more about this particular gateway but it's a gateway device and the use case of this particular device means in conjunction of PNSC this virtual appliance execute the rules defined by PNSC security profile okay. some sort of security it is providing inside the network then we have this Cisco virtual supervisor module we have discussed this as well that inside Cisco 1000B we have supervisor module we have Ethernet module supervisor module is something who is providing the control over the uh, virtual Ethernet module okay and then finally you can see this VM manager this also we have seen in the previous recordings that inside VM manager we can manage group of VMs we can apply rules on the group of uh, VM that is known as the port group okay so in this section I'm going to tell you about ASA ASA full form is adapt, uh, adaptive security appliances suppose if you are using virtual ASA then it will be something like ASA small v how we can deploy ASA here you can see in the diagram so we have part 1 and part 2 of this diagram and you can see that I have VLAN 50 VLAN 50 here host 1 host 2 so across these two uh, ESXi host obviously I have my distributed virtual switch that is nothing but the VIM so you can see Vim as well here and then in that I have integrated ASA virtual now because we have integrated this ASA virtual so this ASA virtual can control the traffic from east to west okay and generally that's why we are using some sort of virtual or inserted device inside uh, these traffic so we can we can insert that traffic now if we uh, if we see 
that uh, what is the use case or what are the things that we can achieve uh, with help of ASA firewall so normal things that we used to do with ASA firewall we can do we can create VPN remote VPN we can do NAT we can enable AAA that is nothing but authentication authorization accounting NAT is something you are converting private to public or public to private address or in general one address can be translated to other address remote VPN and side to side side to side VPN means you have two peers in between two peers you are creating either side to side or side to multi side VPN when you have one main hub and then you have branches likewise uh, you can create remote VPN in in case of remote VPN your clients they they will install a small say client VPN or maybe client less VPN software inside their system once they connect with the internet their VPN will come up okay so these things we can do with help of ASA firewall apart from that you can see that in ASA firewall we have option means if we integrate the ASA firewall with some content filter devices then we can do L4 to L7 inspection as well okay so L4 to L7 inspection by that uh, apart from IP address and the port number you can filter the well-known uh, protocols you can filter the uh, URL, URL content filtering all these things you can do then how you can operate the ASA firewall we can operate with help of CLA, uh, CLI command line interface or we can use GUI as well so for that you need to install ASDM and with help of ASDM you can manage the rules you can manage everything inside that ASA firewall apart from that we have other option as well like security manager that is the management tool that allows security policy consistency across multiple ASA firewall uh, instance through object management events monitoring and all those sort of things so we can use this as well that is the security manager and from there not only we can manage but we have the reporting capabilities as well we can check the health performance all those things okay finally we have this option of uh, API as well application programming interface and we can uh, with help of the restful API we can do all sorts of things inside the virtual ASA firewall this also I have explained you uh, with help of vManage and SGVAN and we have some methods like put get post delete with help of those methods we can write the rules and even we can track we can monitor we can configure we can do all this, all sort of things inside the virtual ASA firewall okay so I'm very much good with this particular section let us close here our next topic is Cisco cloud service router 1000V here you can see in the diagram that inside virtual private cloud I can install CSR 1 and 2 and then it is connected means I can do the configuration it is connected here in the Amazon store that is S3 then again we have gateway polar this is again the Amazon then you can see here in the private virtual cloud cloud I can communicate with the cloud or with the router that is there in Azure something you can say that cloud to cloud communication we can do with help of this CSR careful provisioning okay now why we need this CSR because it's uh, it's uh, one of the cloud router from Cisco that is the one thing second thing it's uh, easy to manage and deploy now as we have seen in the early classes that we need some sort of L3 capabilities as well that means that I want to do some sort of say routing some sort of uh, layer 3 functionality so for that I need a tight or a capable iOS iOS XE based operating system from where I can manage all those or all these tasks okay so uh, this particular CSR will provide all these capabilities all these features that we have in the traditional Cisco routers such as say IPv4 or IPv6 capability even we can translate v4 to v6 we have BGP ca uh, capabilities we have OSPF EIGRP policy based routing then we have say first hop 
uh, gateway protocol or first hop redundancy protocols something like VRRP, GLBP uh, even it can support multicast and it can support uh, VRF that is the virtual routing forwarding so whatever things uh, we have in the normal routers like if you see uh, 2800, 2900, 3800 all these routers uh, although those are physical boxes here all these capabilities we are getting inside this uh, you can say the virtual or you can say the software type of router apart from that we have the features of MPLS Ethernet over MPLS zone based firewall we can create uh, VP, VPNs as well either side to side or multi site like uh, DM VPN then we have easy VPN and this VPN can support IC version 2 in terms of flex VPN as well we can create ACL we can easily integrate with WCCP means we can do some sort of web caching as well uh, with respect to these particular routers so uh, okay so let us discuss uh, this particular topology again these are very high level topology once you deploy it then you'll find that there are obviously complexity deploying these routers but here you can see that uh, inside cloud inside say VPC virtual private cloud I have my two CSR router one is termed as corporate one is termed as partner inside VLAN and VXLAN you can see now these CSR routers they have VPN over any transport irrespective of internet or MPLS they can create VPN tunnel and they can segregate the corporate and partner tra partner traffic or clients and you can think this as a say, tenant A, tenant B inside tenant A again I, I have say corporate and inside tenant B again I have corporate and partner likewise ok so we can achieve these targets, uh, targets no problem with CSR how we can configure it we have option to configure via CLI we, we can do some sort of API programming or API calls as well we can use our catalog service as well so these options we have to do the configuration for this particular thousand V ok so hope this particular point of time you understand about this CSR in CCNA course we don't have to deploy CSR we need to understand the features and capability of thousand V and what we can achieve with this particular thousand B. Next we have Citrix NetScaler or you can consider any load balancer. The mechanism will be the same. So either it's a Citrix or a F5 or any other load balancer. What is happening you can see here first of all these load balancer are termed as server load balancer or SLB in short. Now this server load balancer actually they are working as a proxy in between client and server and why we need uh, this type of proxy device in between because say if number of clients will, will increase say suppose from 4 to it will increase to 10k then what will happen so at that point of time it's very difficult or it's almost impossible that to track that which particular request goes to which particular server so imagine if these 10k request will go to only one server although you have suppose five servers then what will happen means this server will go out of services obviously it will 100% or more than 100% utilize its bandwidth bandwidth in terms of say CPU or RAM or whatever hardware resources it has plus the services correct so just to improve the overall throughput or improve the relationship between the client and the server we need a proxy device in between or we need some sort of management device in between who can manage the connections say between the client and the server now it seems like it's a very simple type of thing okay I just have to manage the connections or request from client to server but actually it's not now the job of this server load balancer is huge because not it is working simply as a proxy device in between but 
it can do n number of things that we'll see that what are the features or capabilities we have whenever we introduce server load balancer in between client and server here are some terms that we need to understand so what type of terms we have first of all we have a user they will send something called application request now these request first of all will go to the virtual ip now the request will go to virtual ip but if you are here at the user place what will think that you are sending that request to the actual server okay but instead of that actual server they will go to say virtual virtual ips and these vip actually they represents some sort of virtual servers so actually the request will not go to the actual server first of all it is served via slb in terms of virtual servers now these virtual servers they have virtual ip so whatever relationship between client say client will think he is sending the request to the actual device but there is uh, but we have in between device so we have relationship between say the user and the device in between this this is the device so between the user and between this device this relation is is fulfilled with help of virtual ip because client no virtual ip but they are actually sending the request to the virtual servers okay so that is one part now what is the second part the second part is the relationship between the load balancer and the server so how this load balancer knows that which server is up or which server is down how this load balancer knows that okay which server is using most of the connections or list of the connections which of the servers they are free at the moment which of the servers have these applications okay so all these tracking type of things they have and how they are tracking with help of um, say synthetic request something called monitor so with help of monitor they are actually keeping tracking or monitoring the server availability say in terms of what services they have correct that means between the load balancer and between the server what terms will get so we'll get terms like monitor we get terms something like server we get terms something like services so these things will be used inside say server load balancer and the servers plus we have some sort of algorithm so either it's a least, least connection or there are so many n number of connections uh, n number of algorithms are there like round robin or least use least connection that you can refer and the actual slb document for that but there are n number of algorithms so now uh, we have two portions so one portion what it is telling that okay client can send request to so client they are sending the request to the virtual server but actually they will send request to the virtual ip that will be served by a virtual server now this virtual server will glue that request or that virtual server to the actual server and they will check that what is the availability of these servers say with help of say tracking with with help of monitoring tracking or synthetic requested and they will check the availability of the servers so once what will happen once this end to end connection built or established then what will happen that your slv load balancer they will create some sort of a sticky table so they know that okay client 1 is going to server 3 client 2 is going to server 4 client n going to uh, server m like that they have this sticky table now if you know asf r wall you can think this as a state full table where they have a state of the connections such as they also have these sticky connections sticky table actually so next time if the request will come from client 1 this slv they don't need to search or form the uh, headers or f f you can think like a control uh, connection simply they have something called 
control already built here they can send the data according to the sticky table so they will refer to their table they will not again send the cook uh, sorry send the request to any of the servers check the availability and then it will reply to the client rather they will refer to their own sticky table okay so i hope this particular point of time you understand what are the key terms inside the server load balancer and here you can see what does mean by server servers are basically the ip address from servers okay that receive the connection dispatched from the slb what is service obviously service is something like logical representation of application running over server correct what is monitor monitor is nothing but the synthetic request now you can send simple icmp or you can send complex http packets to check the availability of the servers then we have virtual ip it's nothing but the internal ip of the slb where the client is sending the request now this particular virtual ip is glued with something called virtual server so now the client is thinking that oh i have sent my request to this particular virtual server with virtual ip okay then we have a stickiness table once you have connection has been built at that time the slb will maintain that entry inside its Uh, cache or in, inside its memory we have load balancing methods just to check what load balancing methods we have between the user request and the server who is actually fulfilling that okay and obviously slb will uh, track keep track of this load balancing method obviously when we are raising that client to server means when we whenever we are creating the virtual ip configuration at that time we are providing Uh, such type of things as statically so it depends that which uh, which type of application you are using which type of algorithm okay then these are the steps that we have already discussed you can just have a look to all these steps obviously client will send request to virtual ip then my uh, my load balancer will proxy client so we have proxy device in between in between client and server it will proxy it will make something called a sticky table where it has the association between which client to which server then using the virtual server configuration then we have the load balancing method in between that so if we have n number of clients so at that time which particular client will serve to which particular server so if we have say n number of client and say m number of servers that how the mapping of n to m will happen that can be done with help of load bal load balancing mechanism finally you can see here in the step number 4 that uh, the slb saves the client and the server information in the sticky table for future communication okay so these are the things that we need to have the service between client and the servers then finally we have some features so let us discuss about these features one by one definition to know here so here you can see the first feature is content switching so whenever you are traveling from one place to other place and with respect to say l4 to l7 because these are the application layers or towards application layer so these type of things that they can do they can provide content switching then we have ssl layer acceleration because this is huge generally you will find the client to server uh, binding or relationship or the query request are ssl based secure socket layer based but if you have n number of request obviously you need some acceleration in between that so they can do that ex, uh, ssl acceleration they can use the tcp connection and they can reuse the tcp connections as well again uh, you will find a algorithm in between that so actually these tasks are complex task that they are doing inside the box so all these things you can see either it's content switching obviously you need algorithm for that so ssl acceleration that is also a complex task tcp connection reuse also need algorithm to perform that then object compression according to the availability they can compress to increase or raise the bandwidth scale 
Then finally we have web acceleration. Obviously if you are thinking about web acceleration, all these systems they will do some sort of cache or otherwise they use some mechanism so whenever we are opening the page it will open fast. That is the web application and finally they can do application firewall. Say inside F5 load balancer or inside say any of the load balancer either Citrix or any other vendor. Now they are and now they have their own application layer firewalls as well as a separate product. So can uh, show so they can do the application uh, layer filtering because maybe in the application request or in application files some sort of uh, uh, virus or malicious things inside the signature it can be hide. Okay, so these application firewalls they they are doing deep packet inspection inside that file or inside that packet just to uh, check some malicious code or some abnormal thing in, in, inside the network. So they have such, uh, such capabilities inside these uh, load balancers. Okay. So I hope you understand all these terms. P uh, please uh, go through this once or twice because if you are studying this first time then you will find uh, it's very interesting and they have their own world. All these F5 load balancer or Citrix uh, load balancer, they they are also a big networking companies and they have their own domain. It's a big domain. Okay. Let's just close here then. Let us discuss about WAS and VPath. Now WAS is nothing but uh, you can think this as a optimizer in terms of wide area network and the full form is wide area application service. Generally what happens if you see your data center or your infrastructure you'll find that you have data centers somewhere and these data centers are geographically separated or located with help of some ISP maybe you have MPLS maybe you have internet and then you have branches so branch 1 to N okay now what happened in this case that suppose if these branch users they want to use certain applications they have to go across either MPLS or internet and inside this data center they have their application servers. Now reaching to this particular say WAN path or reaching to this particular transport there may be chances of loss, latency, jitter, delay all these things. These things can be minimized with help of wide area application services. Okay, and how they are doing this? Obviously, they are running so many different types of protocols and they provide this optimal path from one location to other location. What are the types we have? Here you can see on your screen that we have something called very famous Cisco appliance that is WAVE, wide area virtualization engine and other we can insert service module inside ISR routers. Now how they are achieving this task? They are achieving this task with respect to certain algorithms that they are running such as TCP flow optimization means they can collect several TCP flows and according to those TCP flows they will cut down or they will summarize these TCP flows and they have minimum number of TCP flows between a user to a application provider. Okay, So that's why they are giving uh, better uh, performance means they are reducing loss latency jitter. Then they have this data redundancy elimination. If they are finding there are n number of communication those are duplicate from A to B. They are reducing with help of certain algorithm obviously. This compression method we are very familiar so even we are downloading from something say from Google Drive at that time Google Drive zipping that part, uh, particular file and then you can download it. Why that Google Drive is zipping that particular file? Because it will compress. So what is the technique here? Technique is very simple that while you are sending the packet you can compress, you can send over the link. Here the receiver end they, they can decompress and Obviously they can extract that compressed file and then you have the destination and this is vice versa. So from source to destination, destination to source, they can use this compression method and this is the 
uh, algorithm used inside that that is the persistent limp limp is uh, zip plz and if you want you can just google on it that how this com uh, compression method actually working and what are the you can say the mathematics or the logic behind this compression methodology then finally we have application optimization so we have certain applications such as a uh, application running over SSL, uh, application running over HTTP, SMB, file system, application pro uh, programming interfaces, Citrix applications. So all these applications, all these applications actually they are a separate program. And in all these applications or all these programs, if you use certain codes, if you use certain algorithm, means there are ways or tricks to do the optimize all these applications so individually for application by application by application you need to learn these things means how uh, you can do the programming for that and all these things is done with help of VAS so VAS is intelligent enough who can provide you application optimization TCP optimization compression methods data redundancy elimination so all these things you will get from the VAS engine. Simply you have to go inside the VAS GUI and you have to enable these things. Okay? Now next we have vService path. What does it mean by vService? vService is nothing but a intelligent service inside your 1000V. So we, we have a study about Nexus 1000V and we know that inside Nexus 1000 we, ha we have something called VSM that is the supervisor module we have something called ETH module or Ethernet module now vPath is something that will provide you abstraction to insert the services services such as firewall, load balancer, VPN so whatever type of services you have uh, with help of vPath you can insert that inside that virtual appliance that is the 1000V and then you can use it. What is the example of this? So let me explain you with this example. You can see here that user is sending his data. So I have the user machine and here I have the server. Means we can think like this. In between I have a web module. In between I have 1000V Nexus 1000V. Now what this 1000V is doing, first of all the traffic is redirected to load balancer. So the user will think that, oh, I have to reach to this particular server. It will be redirected to 1000V or any, any load balancer. Then again that traffic when hits to WIM module, again with help of vPath, it is redirected to WAN optimizer, you can say, or the uh, optimizer appliances that the was now once it is reaching here, uh, reaching here again the return traffic it is redirected with help of vpath to the vsg that is nothing my virtual secure gateway and finally it is reaching to the destination so you can see here that with help of this uh, intelligent vpath inside 1000v it is redirecting the uh, application or you can see the traffic so it is redirecting the application request query or the traffic to say load balancer the optimizers and the firewalls and then finally it is going to the destination so that is the use case of vpath so i hope at this point of time you understand the use of was acceleration or use of wide area application service it's a optimizer that to reduce the loss latency jitter uh, all these uh, things across geographical location and then inside the data center we have something called intelligent switch that will uh, redirect the traffic to the different different services inside the data center finally we reach to our last topic in this particular section that is the virtual appliance container now what does it mean by container container simply means that you have a placeholder where you can put different different things correct and now we are talking about say network containers so what does it mean by network container first of all we'll see what is the textbook definition so according to the definition a network container can be defined as a set of networking services configured in a standardized manner what does it mean we'll come to know by the end of this particular recording but yeah, 
what you can do that you can create different different containers or you can create some virtual separation within the same hardware so what does it mean suppose if you if you know about vrf virtual routing forwarding so you know that you have something called global routing table inside that global routing table you can create vrf 1 2 3 like you can create instances of a global routing table so you have vrf 1 2 3 4 like that that means you have some virtual routing forwarding instance inside or you can say the excluding the global routing table so you have independent routing table like that likewise if you are familiar about say firewall context firewall context is again a virtualization methodology where the same hardware the same one physical ASA firewall you can create multiple contexts and different different customers you can assign these multiple contexts so say customer C1 traffic will go with one context C2 traffic will go via context 2 C3 will go via 3 like that means inside physical hardware you are partitioning the physical hardware into virtual hardwares or virtual appliances you are creating inside one physical big giant box Likewise, we have ADC con uh, context. The same rule applies for F5 load balancer or other load balancer as well, where we ca you can virtualize a physical hardware into a multiple uh, virtual appliances. Here you can see in the diagram, then the picture will be clear to you. You can see here, I have physical router, I have physical firewall, I have physical load balancer. Here inside this physical router I have virtual routing tables VRF VRF like that and here if you segregate this like this then it will be easier for you to understand this so if I draw a line here you can see I have bronze network container I have gold I have diamond like that and if I talk about this particular diamond container so let us focus on this only rest you will understand by understanding this obviously so here you can see that I have virtual routing forwarding so for firewall also I am using virtual firewall for uh, say load balancer also I have virtual containers and then for users also I have virtual users something like users hosted on certain VMware okay if I draw the complete diagram here what you will find that everything will come inside one box and this box you can think as ACI fabric so all these things come uh, can come inside one fabric even all these things uh, they can come inside say NSX that is the VMware product for virtualization for the uh, for a particular data center inside NSX you have router inbuilt you have firewall inbuilt you have switch inbuilt but you can integrate with load balancer so the load balancer is not integrated inside that in case of ACI you have to import firewall say FTD again one type of firewall sensor you have to import like F5 load balancer you have to import other services okay so these but uh, by the end of year means uh, the summary is this that you can virtualize the in entire fabric inside other ACI or NSX and then what you can do that once you have a big container then this particular physical say inside physical resource I have all these virtual resources correct so inside one container I have all those resources so one container you can term as a tenant so I have say tenant C1 customer 1 then I have tenant customer 2 I have tenant customer 3 and here you can see that one tenant you can assign to one customer one tenant you can assign say that may be your silver partner and one tenant you can assign to your bronze partner likewise whatever applications they are using you are charging according to that is that will be the summary of all these things that we are doing and this is already in the production means this terminology or such type of concept is already there in the production in terms of ACI or NSX now here, here you can see that what are the other terms so we have virtual machines obviously we can use VMware virtual machines so we have something called 
vCenter suite, protocol suite. Inside vCenter, we have uh, DBS or virtual switches. Inside that, we have uh, what you can say that VMs of different different operating systems running on the top of that. Suppose if you want to expand your data center from one place to other uh, place, you can use VXLAN technology. That is again MAC in UDP. So all MAC addresses will be encapsulated inside the UDP and that will be transported from one place to other place and uh, this thing we have already covered in the previous sections. Then we have virtual networking services. Now this virtual networking services you can see here can replace device partition, decreasing cloud orchestration, all this stuff. So let me show you this virtual networking services and all the services that we have used. Cisco also use all those things and they come with one fabric or one architecture that is called as VACS architecture. Okay, so let me explain this VACS architecture first and then we will check this particular diagram. See the VACS definition according to Cisco. So using its broad portfolio of virtual network services, Cisco streamlined the creation of virtual appliance container. Okay, so VACS is nothing but virtual appliance cloud segmentation. So you have uh, a big container in terms of virtual appliance cloud segmentation. Inside that you are using three major components. So what are those? I am using Cisco Nexus 1000V as a DBS, but still we don't need to use it because now inside ACS we can call the uh, VMware distributed virtual switch. So we don't need a DVS to call inside ACI, not ACS, sorry for that, ACI. So we have one big fabric called Cisco ACI, application centric infrastructure. Inside that I can call VMware distributed virtual uh, switch that will work as it is, like this Cisco 1000V is working. So here I can uh, type something like DVS, DVS from say VMware I can use. Then the other option we have, that other feature we have Cisco PNSC that we have already uh, explained or we have already covered this, you can check that. Now what is the use of this catalog service to control, uh, control the installation, licensing, configuration of virtual network services. And then finally we need one orchestrator from where we can do automation and programming. For that we have UCS director. It's an orchestration solution that provides the management interface to deploy, provision, and monitor the whole VACS solution. Okay. So now if you add all the pieces that we have studied in last three to four sections, everything is coming into one place in terms of VACS or virtual appliance cloud segmentation. And here you can see what is the overall architecture diagram, although it's a uh, high level overview, but you will get an idea that okay, you have Vacus administrator, he is doing cloud orchestration either with help of GUI or REST API. We have orchestrator called UCS director, then we have say VM manager, Cisco Nexus 1000V, PNCS. With help of those things, 